Good morning. I've been informed that we do have a quorum, so the, hop, the 2021 Hopkinton Town Meeting will come to order. Please rise and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. And then let's uh, also remain standing while we observe a moment of silence for those town employees and volunteers who have passed away since our last town meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now a moment of silence. Thank you, and please be seated. In the interest of an expeditious meeting, I'm going to shorten my usual introductory comments. Here are the rules of the meeting. Uh, ordinarily, I would speak about the bounds of the hall, but today it's the bounds of the circus tent. Only registered voters are entitled to sit in the area designated for voting which this year represents the tented area on the football field. Anyone who wants to speak should rise, come to a microphone, and ask to be recognized by the moderator. When recognized, state your name and street address. Since we're attempting to conclude all of town business, including a special town meeting today, we will limit all speakers to two minutes. Exceptions will be made for those presenting major budget and planning board articles who will be given some, and some is in italics and bold, additional leeway. So be clear in stating your position. Keep your comments brief and on point. Please respect the social distancing requirements and wear your masks other than when speaking to the meeting. I will allow discussions of articles to run their course. However, if I feel that items are being repeated or rehashed, I will respectfully request that we move on. Only those who are recognized by the moderator may speak, and you should stop when asked by the moderator. A speaker may have a second opportunity to speak only when all others have had a chance to enter the discussion. Any and all discussion must be directed strictly to the article that is under consideration. All questions go through the moderator. We do not allow debating. Please do not stand other than to address the moderator to vote or to make use of the comfort facilities. If you are proposing an amendment, state the amendment at a microphone and present a written version to the moderator. Please be respectful of meeting members' time and have your written amendments ready quickly. Finally, remember that we are neighbors before the meeting and will continue to be after the meeting. We are here participating for the betterment of our town. Let's maintain our civility and keep our minds open to persuasion. We are now ready to start the meeting. I call on our town clerk, Connor Deegan, to come forward for the call and return of the warrant. Greetings to the constables of the town of Hopkinton in the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You are hereby required to notify and warn all inhabitants of the town of Hopkinton qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs of the annual town meeting and special town meeting warrant this day, Saturday, May 8th, 2021. Hereof and fail not, and make the due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the clerk of said town of Hopkinton at the time and place aforesaid, given under our hands this eighth day of May, 2021. Thank you, Connor. The first order of business is to appoint a deputy moderator. I nominate Muriel Kramer to serve in that capacity. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? And so Muriel will be our deputy moderator. Uh, before I turn this 
for the uh, the opening uh, motions from the chair of the of the select board. Um, in prior years, it has been our custom at town meeting to allow the town moderator to recognize an individual or individuals who have contributed greatly to the benefit of our community. This year I've chosen three organizations who through their efforts have served to inform, educate, and engage Hopkinton residents about the workings of our town government and about the happenings with our, within our community. Those articles are the Hopkinton Independent, Hopkinton News, and EHOP, and I would call their representatives to come forward at this time. While they're coming forward, a uh, little quote. Thomas Jefferson said, the press is the best instrument for enlightening the mind of man and improving him as a rational, moral, and social being. In this age of alternative and fake news, we in Hopkinton can be thankful that we have three organizations dedicated to the principles of a free and open press that the founders of our nation felt were critical to our success as a democracy. We are the envy of our fellow communities because of these organizations and the information which they bring us. Here is some brief background on each organization. The Hopkinton Independent was founded by Sarah Duckett on my far right in 2000 and continued under her stewardship until 2018 when she sold the newspaper to David Bagdon and Susan Odell Farber. The Independent today is edited by Jerry Spar and continues to be delivered in print copy to every household in Hopkinton. Hopkinton News, affectionately referred to as Hop News, was founded by Bob Falcioni in September 2003 as an online news source. He and Hop News achieved worldwide fame for its firsthand reporting of the Entwistle tra tragedy in January 2006. Uh, unfortunately, Bob is not able to be with us this morning, but we do want to recognize him. And then finally, EHOP, formerly Educate Hopkinton, was created in 2007 with a mission to provide timely and factual information about key town matters with the goal of increasing government transparency and fostering civic engagement. EHOP provides information on town and school budget related issues and conducts an annual forum to help us better understand the articles that will be presented in our town meetings. Representing EHOP today are Nanda Barker Hook and Smitha Ram. Let's stand and recognize all of their contributions to the town of Hopkinton. Thank you very much. I now call on Brendan Ted Stone, Chairman of the Select Board, for a beginning motion related to the May 8, 2021 special town meeting. After we have conducted the special, I will call on him again for a beginning motion related to annual town meeting and for the customary procedures relating to the adjournment of the annual. Mr. Ted Stone. Thank you, Tom. Oops, sorry. Uh, good morning. With the moderator's indulgence, I would like to take a moment to explain how I'll be handling the two meetings through the motions I will make as the select board chair. As you know from the moderator, we're starting with a special town meeting. Therefore, the first motion I'm going to make is that the special town meeting proceed through all of its articles. There are two, and once done, I will move to formally end or dissolve the special town meeting. At that point, the moderator will begin the annual town meeting. I will then move to set our customary procedures, which will include proceeding with the annual town meeting 
until we have voted on all articles in the annual town meeting warrant. Thank you, Mr. Ted Stone. So now we're in the special town meeting and article one, senior citizens mean tested property tax exemption. I move that the May 8, 2021 special town meeting proceed through all articles in the special town meeting warrant until done. Second. Any further discussion? Well, uh, let's turn to uh, appropriation committee, Mr. Manning. <laughs> well, let's get his recommendation. Uh, before Mr. Manning, right. the, the motion was to uh, um, conduct special town meeting until uh, uh, and close it after the two articles have been considered. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Now to Article 1. Okay. Article 1. Senior citizens means tested property tax exemption. Um, the Appropriation Committee, uh, we move the... Uh, Motion as printed in the special town meeting uh, warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, uh, this is a uh, this article would implement the local option of extending a means-tested senior citizen property tax exemption that is currently in place. The exemption was originally approved for the town by the legislature, Chapter 234 of the Act Acts of 2018. The authorizing legislation allows for town meeting to extend this provision for three years at a time. So this, at this point, this is a, um, a reauthorization and a fairly perfunctory item. Is there any discussion of this article? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to close? No one's speaking, okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. <clears throat> article two, elementary school feasibility study. Mr. Ted Stone. We move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and Motions document. And the uh, select board? Select board recommends approval. <clears throat> Mr. Manning. Appropriation Committee recommends approval. And school committee, representative from the school committee? They're over at that mic, they'll be right over. The school committee recommends approval. Um, and will the school committee speak to the article or will the select board? School committee. School committee. Dr. Cavanaugh, the su school superintendent, will speak to the article. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Carol Cavanaugh, superintendent of the Hopkinton Public Schools. In your manila envelope packet, you'll see a slide deck printed for you. It's entitled Hopkinton Public Schools Special Town Meeting, Article 2, Elmwood School Feasibility Study. And if you could take that out and follow along with me, that would be appreciated. As many of you know, over the years, we have submitted a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Elmwood School. In March of 2020, just as the pandemic was beginning, we also submitted a statement of interest to the MSBA. Typically what happens in that timeline is that the Massachusetts School Building Authority lets districts know whether they've been invited in or not in December. In December of 2020, we did not hear from the Mass School Building Authority. At that time, they indicated that they were unsure as to whether or not they were going to be able to offer schools partnerships in building projects for this go-round. Again, in January, February, March, we still heard nothing. In April, the schools were alerted that there would be a Mass School Building Authority hearing on April 14th, indicating whether or not school districts would be invited in. 
And so, along with many other districts across the state, Hopkinton attended and we were invited into the period of eligibility. This is why we have a special town meeting article today. This has come up very quickly and with urgency. At this time, what we are doing is we are being invited only into a period of eligibility, which lasts for 270 days. This period of eligibility does not mean that we are voting today on building a school. That's not what's happening. We could never build a school without permission through voting from this community. What we are asking for today is to have funding to move from eligibility to feasibility which I will explain to you through this, these slides. So why are we in this situation? We're working on this project because we have enrollment concerns and space constraints at the Elmwood School. If you take a look at slide number four, you can see the projected enrollment for the Hopkinton Public Schools. Over the next 10 years, it's expected that we will be somewhere around 4,000 745 students large. Naturally, this is a projection. But if you take a look at slide five, you can see that when, before we put the modular classrooms on Elmwood, Elmwood was designed for 520 students. That was essentially its capacity at that time. We added four classrooms pretty much for students who are already here because we have an enrollment at Elmwood today just around 600 students. If each of those four classrooms holds 20 children, we are now at capacity again at the Elmwood School, an indication that we are still playing catch up in terms of physical space in your public schools. If you go to slide six, you'll see something very illuminating. Even if we have added classrooms, spaces in those schools are still too small. Slide six is a facilities assessment that was completed by an architectural firm upon our request. If you look at those red spaces on that drawing, you will see that the cafeteria space is significantly too small for the 600 students who attend the Elmwood School. You will also see that some of those smaller spaces, office space and small teaching spaces, are not available to our students at this time. Elmwood was built in 1964, and in that era, we did not have those kinds of small group instruction we do today for our students who need remedial work in math or reading, for students who are on individual education plans, and for students who speak languages other than English. We have needs in this community now that are unmet in terms of space, not in terms of instruction. The condition of the building also warrants a partnership with the MSBA. Elmwood, as I said, was built in 1964. That building is nearing its 60th birthday. It's built on a Tennessee gas line, a fact that cannot be altered. Elmwood contains significant asbestos. It's overcrowded. The play area is much too small to accommodate the children who attend that school. And so what's happening currently is we have kids playing in fields, or if you drive by Elmwood, you'll often see them on the blacktop. Elmwood School is our geographical outlier. We had two modulars. We've added four. There is no more space for modular classrooms. There are parking restrictions electrical shortcomings, technology limitations, and we, again, desperately need office space. We have submitted to the MSBA statements of interest in the years 2008, 12, 13, 17, 18, and 19. Finally, in 2020, we have been invited into the MSBA. I won't belabor these points, but I have included for you some pictures of the instructional spaces at Elmwood. You can see that we are teaching kids on the stage. Our OTPT room has been split with a divider. If you look at the very top of that picture, you can see that there's a wall 
that can be put up and taken down between those two spaces. We teach children in hallways. We have built artificial classrooms within classrooms. We have speech and language taking place in very, very small spaces. And our ESOL students, and these are all pre-pandemic pictures, were being taught on, by two different teachers in two different sort of artificial classrooms with a curtain down the middle of them. We share space with storage and special education instruction. And we have heating and cooling irregularities such that in the winter we have open windows and space heaters all in the same building. So what are we asking you to vote on today? We've been invited only into a period of eligibility. That period of eligibility will last for 270 days. That's not negotiable. There are steps that the town and the schools need to take before you move from eligibility to feasibility. But right now, on this chilly day in May, we are at annual town meeting. And there is not another town meeting between now and January 28th when the period of eligibility ends. And so we need your approval of $1 million for a feasibility study today so that that money is available in January of 2022. The eligibility period does not mean we're building a school, and it does not guarantee that we get invited into feasibility. But you can't move from eligibility to feasibility without having the $1 million available to you. People may be wondering, why is it that we didn't ask the town to take on debt, and rather, we are asking to take the money from the host community agreement that has been made between the schools and Legacy Farms. The spirit of that agreement, the spirit of it, was to address enrollment growth. And that's primarily the reason, one of the, the key reasons, that we are looking to engage with the MSBA for Elmwood. As I've pointed out, Elmwood School is just too small. It's, at capacity now for classrooms, but many of the learning space and the cafeteria space are too small. It really cannot accommodate any additional growth. We also, over time, will build that HCA account to $4.129 million. If we take a million dollars out, there will still be $3.129 million in that account. And finally, the timing to seek debt just isn't working with the urgency of the timeline that we're working with with the MSBA. If we are able to take money from the host community agreement, it will have no tax impact on resident tax bills in the town of Hopkinton, and that may be welcome right now as we emerge from a pandemic. The feasibility study money needs to be available now, even though we're not going to be using it until January again a troubled timeline. And finally, just as a reminder, that period of eligibility lasts 270 days. The feasibility study also lasts 270 days. This will then be followed by a period of design. Essentially, our building project could not proceed any sooner than July of 2023, and it would not proceed without a vote from this community. All we're asking today is that town meeting vote to move $1 million from the HCA Stabilization Fund uh, over so that it can be used by the Elementary School Building Committee 2. We are in the process of putting together a new school building committee, the ESBC 2, when the time comes in January. Thank you. Are there any questions from the public? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. This requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor, please stand with your uh, yellow cards. Do you want to try a voice vote so you can get unanimous? Well, I think typically with these. Uh, I don't see anyone. Oh, well, there's a couple of us. Four in the staff tent.
I can see I'm going to get my exercise today. <laughs> 21 on the stage and, uh, and up in the booth. Stage right, 37. Stage right, 37. Center is 47. Center is 47. So are, are, are we all set then under the tent in terms of? What's that? <laughs> okay. That's 105. 105. All those opposed? Please stand with your cards. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, stage right, zero. Stage looks like it's one. Yeah. That's a moot point. Okay, it, it appears that uh, the vote is 105 in favor, one opposed, clearly two thirds majority. So the, uh, the article passes. Mr. Ted Stone, dissolution of special town meeting. I move that the 2021 annual town meeting proceed through, no, I'm sorry, I move that the May 8, 2021 special town meeting be dissolved. Second. All those in favor of dissolving special town meeting signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Special town meeting is dissolved. Mr. Ted Stone. I move that the 2021 annual town meeting proceed through all articles on the 2021 annual town meeting warrant until done. Second. Been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're into the annual town meeting at this point. Starting with Article 4. Article 1, Acceptance of Town Reports. Mr. Kamalo. You should all have the annual town report to take home and put on your bookshelves. I, 
Uh, move that the town accept the reports of the town offices, boards, and committees. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor of accepting the town reports uh, through Article 1 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Article 2, Fiscal Year 2021 Supplemental Appropriation and Transfers. Mr. Tedstone. Okay. Mr. Moderator? Mr. Um, Mr. Kamalo. Mr. Manning. Article 2, Fiscal Year 2021, Supplemental Appropriations and Transfers. Uh, we, move the the mo we, we move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is a, uh, uh, our Fiscal 2021 Supplemental Appropriations, and uh, the article transfers from the 2021 into our Fiscal Year 2021. Uh, $528,720.55 from certified free cash to the snow and ice control operating budget, $81,672.16 from certified free cash to the Parks and Recreation Enterprise Fund, $832 from certified free cash to the Hopkinton Police Detail Agency Fund, and $510 from certified free cash to the Parks and Recreation 53D revolving account. Mr. Ted Stone, Select Board. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article three, unpaid bill from prior fiscal years. Mr. Manning. Article three, unpaid bills from prior fiscal years. Uh, years. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is uh, unpaid unpaid bills. We have a few uh, that have come in. So we have uh, from the Water Department, we have to five hundred five dollars seventy eight cents. Uh, facilities Department, three thousand six hundred fifty five dollars. Department of Public Works, eight thousand four hundred seventy seven and forty four cents. Department of Public Works, one hundred ten dollars. Municipal Departments, $861.42. Parks and Recreation, $5,108.68. Mr. Ted Stone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll take a vote. This requires a four-fifths majority. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Thank you. Article 4, excess bond premium. Mr. Manning. Article 4, excess bond premium. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is the reappropriation of $42,498.46 from excess bond premiums uh, to be used for the, the Main Street parking lot um, project. Uh, main, the uh, excess bond premiums is excess amount of money when we put uh, our bonds out or we get for bonds uh, that the multiple buyers, they put bids in and sometimes there are excess bond uh, funds available for that, from that, and we're applying that to the Main Street parking lot project. Mr. Ted Stone? Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? This requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 5, set the salary of elected officials. Mr. Manning. Article 5, set the salary of elected officials. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Uh, this, this is the amount of $73,527 for the town clerk position. 
Mr. Tadstone? Select board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 6, Fiscal 2022, Operating Budget, Mr. Manning. Article 6, the Fiscal Year 2022 Operating Budget. Uh, we move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. I do have a presentation. I don't know if other groups want to approve, rec make the recommendations first for my... Uh, uh, okay. Mr. Ted Stone? Select Board recommends approval. Okay, Mr. Manning, for your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Moderator and citizens of Hopkinton. The Appropriation Committee is pleased to present the fiscal year 2022 budget for your consideration. In preparation for today's annual meeting, the Appropriation Committee has developed a comprehensive 79-page report covering the budget and financial articles with a lot of support from the Town Hall staff. That report has been posted online and is provided by in your packet today. As with so many aspects of our work lives and personal lives during, during the COVID-19 emergency, the town budget process during this cycle has been challenging, has been marked by a lot of uncertainty about revenue sources, and has a flex, required a flexible approach. One of the town's core financial principles is to budget in a cautious and prudent way, which means taking a pessimistic view of potential revenue inflows. The, revenue, the review process paid close attention to carefully evaluate the targeted service level increases that have been included in this budget. Throughout the winter and spring, there was considerable uncertainty about the revenue estimates. Specifically, there was concern about whether the state government would be able to sustain the strong level of local aid that helped the town balance the budget in the first full year of the COVID-19 emergency. Since local aid from the state is the town's second largest revenue source after property tax, this was a key concern. <clears throat> in a favorable development, our latest information is that the state, state's net local aid to Hopkinton will not only be sustained, but is estimated to rise by 11.6% based on a combination of both higher levels of funding and lower charges for state and regional services. Throughout the development stage of the fiscal year 2022 budget, plans were in place to recommend tapping into the, gen the town's general fund stabilization account and the school department stabilization account as a way to preserve service levels and provide for the expanded services in the budget while still controlling immediate tax impact. Fortunately, key developments in the town's favor have made a draw on stabilization <clears throat> accounts unnecessary. Another revenue concern involved motor vehicle excise tax receipts. The town's income from excise tax can drop when new vehicle sales decline sharply and problems many of you have experienced with the State Registry of Motor Vehicles database have made forecasting excise tax revenue a challenge in this cycle. In the final estimate with the latest information, local receipts, including excise tax, are budgeted to be up 2.7%. To add a final level of confidence in this budget, the town has already made good use of $2.5 million in federal COVID-19 aid and the town is slated to receive an additional $5.9 million under the new Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, available to us through the first half of 2024. Although this new money comes for, with some pretty strict restrictions, it will certainly cover some emergency surge costs, and it gives the town high confidence that the budget presented can be supported. Finally, the town's elected and appointed leaders are always concerned about the impact of property tax increases. And this has been particularly true during the COVID-19 emergency when many of our citizens are facing extra economic hardship. So through a combination of cost containment and some good news on estimated revenues, the proposal for today's town meeting, if approved, would deliver a balanced budget, one that sustains fiscal year 2021 service levels across departments that pays for contractual and other inflationary cost <clears throat> increases that resumes normal capital spending that has been paused in fiscal year 2021, and that provides for targeted increases in the schools and in human services. And it is a budget that is balanced without drawing the town's stabilization accounts. I mentioned that this budget proposal, proposal contains some targeted service level increases. Specifically, the proposed budget provides the Hopkins Public Schools with a substantial increase for 18.6 new positions at a first year salary cost of $959,000 
with additional benefit costs paid outside the school budget. The school department will address you on this increase during the discussion of this article. In other town departments, a counseling position has been added to expand service delivery in the youth and family services department, and a half-time senior services van driver who was formerly funded by a grant is included in the budget for the first time. There's also one additional po new police patrol officer in the budget, but that position will be funded in the first year under a host of community agreement with the Legacy Farms developer, and while it's not in the budget, I'm very happy to report that the school department and Youth and Family Services have worked together to identify grant funding for the Social Emotional Adjustment Counselor at the high school. The tax impact of the proposed budget on existing homeowners has been computed to be 2.86% if all four of the capital items proposed as debt to be excluded from the limits of Prop Proposition 2.5 are approved by town meeting and by the voters at the May 22nd town election. That 2.86% would, would add about $320 on the existing $11,195 tax bill for the Hopkinton's average residence, which now has a value of $655,500. The specific Appropriation Committee departmental line by line dollar recommendations are in the report on pages 60 through 70, with the specific dollar recommendations in the right-hand column titled Appropriation Committee Recommendations. The operating budget presented today does a good job of addressing pressing needs within existing constraints, including tax impact. I also want to be very briefly discuss the longer term horizon for the operating budget. Between 2011 and 2021, the valuation of property in Hopkin rose from $2.7 billion to $4.5 billion, a 65% trump driven both by new construction and steep growth in the value of existing property. Residential property counts for over 84% of that amount, and while we have an independent, important commercial and industrial presence, the numbers show that Hoppington is truly a community of homes and families. Considering the general fund pay-as-you-go capital proposals, enterprise funds, and community preservation, budgeted spending will top $103 million in the coming year. Current debt, debt levels are well within the town's established policy limits and are well within the state's statutory limit for municipal debt. The town is making expected progress on funding long-term liabilities, which has been a long-standing goal. Hopkins Public Employee and Pension is tracking to be fully funded by 2037, and other post-employee benefit, or OPEB, liability for public employee retiree health care, is tracking to be fully funded by 2050. Hopkinton retains the very highest bond rating, Standard & Poor's AAA, which allows the town to borrow for construction and proven projects at the very low possible financing cost. In addition to that very positive news, the town does face several noteworthy long-term financial challenges, and I specifically noted these challenges in last year's presentation. First, there has been public discussion about scenarios for new school construction, with initial rough cost estimates of various options ranging from $25 million to $157 million. Depending on timing of expenditures, costs at the high end of that spectrum would push the town or perhaps pass its debt limit and would, of course, have very significant tax impact results. I encourage everybody to follow and participate in public discussions about the development of plans for new school construction. Second, over the past decade, the town has relied on new revenue from new residential construction, especially at Legacy Farms, to not only cover the cost of expanded services tied to growth, but to also cover a portion of the inflationary cost increases in town salaries and expenses that are unrelated to growth. If new residential development slows, as it is expected, inflation, inflationary costs for providing ongoing services that are above the 2.5% property tax increase allowed by law will create future budget shortfalls. Third, with these pressures, it will be important for the town to focus on spending control both within the cost base for existing services and in considering what new service expansions can be undertaken. The development of spending plans for fiscal year 2023 and beyond will have to balance these competing pressures. The town elected and appointed leaders are tracking these two issues very closely. In fiscal year 2021, general fund and enterprise fund capital spending was paused in response to the uncertainty about the town revenues tied to the COVID-19 public health emergency. The budget for fiscal year 2022 resumes, resumes capital spending in the general fund, 
as well as in the water and sewer enterprise funds. Four larger projects will be proposed in later articles to be funded through borrowing, and if approved, they will, they will also be voted on at the May 22nd town election. They include $3.625 million for a 6,760 square foot addition to the Marathon School, $3 million for middle school and Hopkins School roof replacement, $350,000 for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, direct digital control upgrades at the middle school, and $250,000 for a roof replacement at the police station. Pays You Go capital item funding is proposed to be restarted again after being paused in fiscal year 2021. With a total of 14 light items to be funded with existing cash by the town at a total cost of $1.8 million. <clears throat> Articles 16 through 26 will cover specific capital recommendations and I'll address those as each of the specific articles come up for a vote. Article 6 also approves administrative spending for the Community Preservation Fund with $72,305 going to staff costs and expenses and authorizes $301,619 to pay for principal and interest on debt approved by the town meeting between 2013 and 2019 for projects including for land acquisitions, improvements at the Fruit Street Athletic Field, and high school athletic field lighting. Finally, Article 6 authorizes spending from cable TV tax receipts in the Public Education and Government Access Enterprise Fund, and also authorizes spending levels in the water and sewer enterprise funds at levels to support the continuation of current services, with that spending to be paid from water and sewer fees charged to users. Specifically, the Water Enterprise Fund will be authorized to spend $2,584,320 for user fee receipts, and the Sewer Enterprise Fund will be authorized to spend $2,409,133 for user fee receipts. Overall, the budget presented today does a very good job of balancing competing priorities at a time when COVID-19 is still impacting many in the community. This budget supports the continuation of excellent public services, and it does so without tapping, tapping stabilization funds to support operations. The select board recommends approval, and the appropriation committee recommends approval. I understand the Hopkinton the Hopkin Public Schools may have additional comments on the operating budget, and will have comments on capital items when those are up for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning, and thank you for all of the, the, the work over the year that the Appropriations Committee has done on behalf of, uh, of the town and of these budgets. <clears throat> At this point, I'd like to turn to the school committee for a um, brief presentation relating to the material that they've included in the, in the packets as it relates to the school committee budget. Thank you. The school committee is going to turn to Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, Superintendent of Schools, and Ms. Susan Rothermick, our Director of Business and uh, Finance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, again, in your packet, you have a slide deck. It's entitled Hopkinton Public Schools, FY22 Budget Presentation, Annual Town Meeting, May 8th, 2021. If you would take a look at that, you can follow along with this presentation. Um, as we go through this presentation, you'll hear that same theme of enrollment projections and enrollment concerns in the Hopkinton Public Schools. In addressing the 2021 22 budget, the FY22 budget, our budgetary goals were to maintain our exceptional academic and extracurricular programs, to offer curriculum and instruction that meets the needs of all of the very disparate learners in the town of Hopkinton. We would need to add teachers and support staff to accommodate increases in student population, to address the resulting growth impacts on all of our departments. You know, it's not just classroom teachers, but that involves more cafeteria workers, more HR, more technology, every time you have more children coming into the district. To focus on student needs, both academic and social emotional as we emerge from the pandemic, and to support all five buildings school improvement plans. So let's discuss enrollment growth. Um, as slide four tells you, we need to be prepared to address enrollment growth, and it's no secret that the town has been playing catch up on that. In slide five, which I have borrowed from the uh, town's growth study committee, 
You can see some of the work that they did looking at the projections over time, and this speaks to that issue of catch-up. While this might be a little bit confusing, what you can see is that in 2015, 16, and 17, NASDAQ, with whom we used to be working, projected very low enrollments out all the way to 25, 26. Right now, our enrollment is much higher than where they estimated it would be as far out as 25, 26. Again, catch up. And so in slide six, you can see what our professional demographer has suggested would be the enrollment in Hopkinton over the next 10 years. We hired a professional demographer, and we did it because we were very concerned about building projects that seem to be uh, behind the enrollment growth in the community. Our demographer used a variety of points to make predictions about where the enrollment growth would go. And we have to remember that these are predict predictions and projections. But it's not enough to use simple math, and it's not enough to use guesswork. So among the data our professional demographer used were enrollment reports that extended from 2009 and 10 all the way to current enrollment, point, uh, enrollment reports 2021. Birth rate data in the town of Hopkinton, the number of housing permits annually from 2010 to 2020, new and proposed housing developments, current information on the Hopkinton real estate market, and consideration of the impacts of the pandemic. Very briefly, slide nine shows you the town's population in 2015 and 2019, an increase of about 2,000 people. If Hopkinton's public schools have about 25% of the town's population enrolled in them, then you can see that about 500 students should have been added, and you'll notice that that is correct when we get to slides 15 and slide 16. In reaching out to the town hall, as of April of 2021, there are several residential developments in progress, 85 single-family homes, and 58 multifamily homes when you take out the trails at Legacy Farms. In terms of real estate, we know that there has been incredible westward expansion out of Boston into Hopkinton, and Hopkinton, as you all know, is a very desirable community to live in. You have exceptional services with a small town, lovely agrarian feel. Niche ranked Hopkinton number one, US News and World Report, named Hopkinton High School third in its last um, rating. We have now dipped to 10th in that rating. You have accessible commuter rails. You have fine DPH, DPW, fire, police, youth and family services, senior care, all of your services are amazing here. Hopkinton was deemed the safest community in the nation and empty nesters are not selling their homes right now. And I wanna take a look at that. So typically what will happen is empty nesters, once their kids have gone off to college, they often downsize, and that is not what's happening in this time of pandemic. And our demographer estimated that it's not happening because people are using those additional spaces in their home because their children aren't being educated on college campuses, but rather remotely in their homes. And people are working from home and people have turned their homes into gyms. So all of that space inside the home is currently being utilized, but what's going to happen in Hopkinton when that changes, when we emerge from a pandemic? If you look carefully at slide 12, again borrowed from the town's growth study committee, you can see periods of rapid growth in Hopkinton that took place in the early 90s and the later 90s. So if you take a look, for example, at 1993, 1994, and 1995, if those homes begin to trans transfer, you are probably going to get families with young children moving into them. You know what kinds of homes were being built here during that period. Again, in 1999 and 2000, a period of, of rapid growth. If those whole homes begin to turn over, again, you are very likely to get children moving into the Hopkinton Public Schools. These are the kinds of data that are important to us in determining what things are going to look like in public schools. We've also included a map here. Slide 14 shows you 
the availability of open land in Hopkinton, and again, borrowed from the Growth Study Committee. Those yellow parcels are parcels that are privately or institutionally owned. These are large, unprotected parcels. You can also see that there are penciled in parcels that indicate the, the acreage of other spaces. There's an awful lot of open land in Hopkinton, and there's an awful lot of places that people could still be building homes. So if we look at our actual enrollment numbers over time, and these are the slides I referred to earlier, 15 and 16, you can see that in 2019-20, the student population during the October Sims report was at 3,875. Today, our enrollment in the Hopkinton Public Schools is 4,021. Dr. Wagman's report indicates that at the end of the 21-22 school year, we should be at 4,024. I'm telling you, I believe that we will be there before September 1st, before school opens in 2021, we will hit that number. Right now, we have 328 students graduating from Hopkinton High School. We have 364 students who have enrolled to come into the Hopkinton Public Schools for the fall. These are people who have already gone into our student information system and completed the registration process. More coming in than going out. So it's likely that we're going to start 2021 with an enrollment larger than what is projected. We estimated that we would be getting 74 new students this year, and that's what we have budgeted very conservatively for. That's what this budget that, we're, that is on town meeting floor right now projects. So every stu 20 students coming into the Hopkinton Public Schools require us to hire 1.4 on average teachers. This fall's projection, as I've said, is at 74. If we round that up to 80, there are four different groups of 20 students, which would get us to about 5.6 FTEs or teachers. And as Mrs. Rothermick goes through that budget process, you'll see that that number is reflected there. The Hopkinton Public Schools continue to provide very high level education at a very low per pupil expenditure. If you very quickly take a look at slides 21, 22, and 23, you'll see that in 2017, according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, our per pupil expenditure was at $14,500. In 2019, we had dipped in that list to 31st. And this is just a group of communities that we've chosen either because they are like us, contiguous to us, or they provide similar services, educational services, to the ones we provide here in Hopkinton. Dr. Kavanaugh, can, can I ask that we jump to the budget request slide and start moving through the budget numbers? Surely. Um, 20, 26 and 27? Yes. And then finally, 23, you can see where we have landed. And so now I'm going to hand this over to Mrs. Rothermick, who will explain the budget process to you. Thank you. Good morning. Following along in that same slide packet, if you look at slide 27, you will see that the budget increase request is 5.4%. Moving into slide uh, 30, Looking just at salaries, contractual increase for salaries is $1.1 million. The requests for staffing, special education, 7.4 personnel, instructional cost and enrollment growth at 5.4 personnel, which refers back to what Dr. Kavanaugh was speaking about in terms of teaching positions just to address growth. Instructional program enhancements at 1.6 personnel. Administrative support and facility enhancements at 4.2. If you look at slide 31, it breaks it down into exactly what each of those positions are. Uh, again, looking just at the instructional cost and enrollment growth, the 5.4 represents 2.4 teaching positions at the Elmwood School and one teaching position each at the middle school, high school, and English language. 
The instructional program enhancements is 1.0 adjustment counselor and a 0.6 position for a math coach at K-5. to <clears throat> And as we have growth, we have growth, growth in the needs for those wraparound services, and that is that last bucket, the 1.0 for technology, a custodian, administrative support, a general education paraprofessional, and a 0.2 for the human resources department. The top bucket, student services, as student needs change, you have that 0.5 personnel for teaching, 4.1 personnel paraprofessional, a 1.0 for a BCBA, 0.4 occupational therapy, 1.2 in nursing, and 0.2 for support. Moving on to the expenses, slide 33. The contractual inflation and current services increase is 231,000. Special education of 42,000. Instructional cost, enrollment growth, 333. And that last bucket, administrative support and facility enhancements of 8,000. So the expense increase of 615,000. Uh, when you're looking at a school budget, most of your increase will always come from staffing. A service budget is always 80% or 80% in salaries. <clears throat> Slide 34, you can see 34 and 35, the details behind the 615,000 in expenses. And then if you move down to slide 38, this just gives you the summary. And again, breaking it out into those buckets, contractual inflation and current services, both salary and expense, the increase of 1.4 million, special education of 319,000, instructional cost and enrollment growth of 695,000, the instructional program enhancements of 130, and the administrative support and facility enhancements of 196,000. So the total requested increase budget for the school department is 2.7 million. Again, that's 5.4%. Thank you, Dr. Cavanaugh and, and Ms. Rodermick. <clears throat> so what we have before us under Article 6, we've broken the 100 million barrier Surely there must be a question or two on our town budget. Mr. Moderator, Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Go right. ahead, Ken. First of all, I'd like to commend everyone that put this budget together. I know it was an awful lot of work. The one thing that I see that might be missing a little bit and maybe priorities for future years would be sidewalks. East side of Hayden Row, connecting Woodville to Hopkinton Center, and to make it safe to cross 495 at West Main Street. I would hope this would be addressed in future years. Thank you. Well, seeing no additional questions, <clears throat> we'll take a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it sounded like it was unanimous to me. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Article 7, Parks and Recreation Revolving Funds. Mr. Ted Stone. We move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Mr. Manning. Appropriation Committee recommends approval. Mr. Ted Stone, an explanation? I'm going to turn this over to my Vice Chair, Mr. Nasrula. This article, um, this article creates a segregated, a segregated revolving fund for the Fruit Street Athletic Fields uh, to match revenue and expenses. The Fruit Street uh, field operations will now be a distinct service line. 
Uh, this segregated revolving fund will support the tracking of revenues and expenses specifically tied to the Fruit Street, Fruit Street fields, including the transfer of an existing balance of 334198 and 77 cents that has been accumulated for the Fruit Street fields. This approach will support the accumulation and eventual use of reserves, specifically earmarked for the periodic ma uh, maintenance and eventual renewal of synthetic turf at the, at the Fruit Street fields. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor of this article signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. <clears throat> Article 8, Fiscal Year 2022, Revolving Fund Spending Limits. Mr. Manning. Article 8, Fiscal Year 2022, Revolving Fund Spending Limits. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Ted Stone. The Select Board recommends approval. Okay. Mr. Manning, any explanation? Yes, under state law and under regulations prescribed by the Massachusetts Department of Revenue as the town's financial regulator, Hopkinton has established a number of self-sustaining revolving funds that are authorized to collect user fees and pay costs to provide certain services. <clears throat> These funds are commonly called 53E half funds as they are authorized by Massachusetts under General Laws Chapter 44, Section 43E and a half. Essentially, um, these are specific amounts and uh, Year over year, we have to re-approve re re them. Um, and I believe most of them are the same. I think there's two that are slightly different of uh, the amounts. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we go through this every year. So I don't know if we need more detail on that. Are there any questions or any discussions on Article 8? Steve Popkus, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Uh, I have a question on the school department one-to-one -one laptop initiative, which is a spending limit of $475,000. I'd like to know how that is going to be attributed since that would basically be 1,000 students or more or less, and we have 4,000 students enrolled. The one-to-one um, -one laptop initiative is really focusing only on the high school level. So the students, um, it's starting in their freshman year, begin a lease program for their, um, their devices, and it goes through their four years. So the one-to-one the -one, um, collects the revenue, um, of the payments for families for those devices, and then pays out the, the cost to purchase those devices. Are there any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of this article, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article nine, CPI for property tax exemptions. Mr. Manning. Article 9, Consumer Price Index for Property Tax Exemptions. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, Mr. Hop Go ahead. Essentially, Hopkinton grants partial taxi property tax exemptions to certain qualifying senior citizens as authorized in Chapter 59, Section 5 of the Massachusetts General Laws. That law the town allows the town to grant limited tax property tax reductions for senior citizens with income and assets beyond their principal residence that are below qualifying levels. Mr. Ted Stone. The select board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Chapter 90 highway funds. Mr. Manning. Chapter, Article 10, Chapter 90 highway funds. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, this is essentially just uh, this is the way the uh, the town will accept Chapter 90 highway funds. That we're this is that we're accepting this amount of uh, six hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, eight hundred seventy-one dollars, as identified in the article. 
Uh, representative from Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements Committee has voted to recommend approval. And Mr. Tadstone for the Select Board. Select Board recommends approval as well. Is there any discussion? Mr. Moderator, Ken Weissman, 145 Ash Street. I'd like to ask the DPW Director, per our highway management uh, uh, scoring system, are our roads getting better or worse? And are we spending enough money in order to keep them at least at they are or maybe make them a little bit better? Through the moderator, good morning, town meeting. My name is John Westerling, and it is my honor to serve this community as your director of public works. Uh, the question is related to our pavement management plan, and we are finding innovative ways this year to make our money go further. We're doing uh, more work with the same level of funding, and we are keeping that uh, pavement condition index at essentially the same level as it has been over the years. We've seen it increasing, and we are maintaining that level. Thank you, Mr. Westerling. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of Article 10, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 11, Other Post-Employment Benefits Liability Trust Fund. Mr. Manning. Article 11, Other Post-Employment Benefits Liability Trust Fund. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this is our, our OPEB for short. It refers to post-employment benefits other than pensions. OPEB generally takes the form of health insurance and dental vision, prescription, and other health care benefits provided for eligible retirees, in some cases for their beneficiaries. This is the fund that we're, we've been uh, adding, adding to every year, and uh, we're on schedule, uh, or we're, we're doing well with it, and I uh, recommend approval. Mr. Tadstone for the Select Board. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of this article signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 12, transfer from the General Stabilization Fund. Article 12, transfer from the General Stabilization Fund. The Appropriation Committee recommends no action. Uh, there is no need uh, to dip into the stabilization fund as we found other revenue funding sources. Mr. Tadstone? The select board recommends approval of the no action motion. Okay, is there <clears throat> any question or discussion from the, uh, from the voters? So the motion is to take no action. All those in favor of taking no action signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we have voted no action. Article 13, transfer from the school department stabilization fund to the general fund. Mr. Manning. Article 13, transfer from the school department stabilization fund to, fund to general fund. Appropriation committee recommends no action. Uh, this, the, we don't need to stipulate, I'm sorry, we don't need to dip into the stabilization fund. Uh, we have other revenue sources at this time. Uh, Mr. Tedstone. The select board recommends approval of the no action motion. And Ms. Fargiano. The school committee also recommends approval of the no action. Okay. Is there any discussion? So we're taking a vote uh, to take no action on this article. All those in favor of taking no action signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 14, transfer from school department stabilization to school department. Mr. Manning. Article 14, transfer from the school department stabilization fund to school department. The appropriation committee recommends no action. Mr. Tadstone. The select board recommends approval of the no action motion. Ms. Fargiano. The school committee also recommends approval of the no action motion. Is there any discussion on this article? 
Seeing none, we're taking a vote on no action. All those in favor of no action on Article 14, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 15, Parks and Rec Enterprise Fund. Mr. Manning. Article 15, Parks and Recreation Enterprise Fund. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, at the May 2nd, 2011 town meeting, a Parks and Recreation Enterprise Fund was created as discussed under Article 2 and Article 7. Finances for the Parks and Recreation Program are being reorganized and this all-encompassing enterprise fund for parks and recreation is no longer required. Mr. Ted Stone. Select board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 15 is written. Indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 16, pay as you go capital expenses. Mr. Manning. Article 16, pay-as-you-go capital expenses. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Ted Stone. Select Board recommends approval. And Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvement Committee recommends approval. Mr. Manning, do you want to speak to this? Yes, please. As discussed earlier, the town's capital improvement program was paused in fiscal year 2021 due to the financing impacts and uncertainty of the COVID-19 public health emergency. This article proposes restarting capital improvements with a list of 14 specific line items requested by the town departments. Each of these 14 items listed in the motion has been reviewed and discussed in public hearings by the select board, by the appropriation committee, and by the capital improvement committee. Most of the funding for these projects, just under $1.5 million, is proposed to come from the town certified free cash, which is a pool of certified surpluses from previous fiscal year's operations. An additional $52,682.11 to support these projects is proposed to come from unspent balances from pre previous capital appropriations, as shown, as, the motion, as shown in the motions document. Finally, the Town Ambulance Fund, which collects Medicare insurance and fee reimbursements for ambulance services provided, is proposed to contribute $300,000 toward the purchase of a new frontline ambulance for the Hoppington Fire Department. Are there any questions about this article? Seeing no questions, all those in favor of Article 16, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 17, Marathon School Edition. Mr. Manning. Article 17, Marathon School Edition. We move the motion as printed, the war printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Mr. Ted Stone. Select board recommends approval. And Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. Okay. School Committee or um, Dr. Kavanaugh? Actually, Susan Rothermick, I'll speak to this. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> two, you. Uh, two, two wrong, one right. That's okay. <laughs> Um, again, you have a slide deck that is uh, entitled the Hopkinton Public Schools Capital Plan. So if you look at slide seven, uh, that is what is speaking to the marathon edition specifically. Again, this is looking to add four classrooms at the end of the existing building with a stairwell. Currently, the design of the marathon school included 13 kindergarten classrooms, 13 first grade classrooms, and four preschool classrooms for a total of 600 students. Currently, we are utilizing 13 kindergarten, 14 first grade, five preschool for 620 students. In addition, there has been an additional intensive special education program that will be opening. 
So what we are doing is we are utilizing space. We are taking out the art room, the health room, and next year we're looking at utilizing the family resource room. So again, these are, these are students that are already here, and we are taking um, spaces within the school because we're unable to fit the number of students that are before us. You'll see that there were areas of the Marathon School that were identified as areas where additions could be put on. And so this is one of the areas where it was identified that the possibility of four additional classrooms at the end. Uh, you can see that we've been doing this um, at each of the schools. And again, this speaks to what Dr. Kavanaugh has been talking to in terms of catch up of our enrollment growth, and these are for students that are already here. So again, these classrooms would be to address the enrollment uh, for the students that are taking, uh, the classrooms that are taking spaces within the building that we do not have room for. Uh, Ms. Ronamick or, or Mr. Manning, uh, would you speak to the way that this would be funded and the town vote that would be required? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. This article provides a total of $3,625,000 for the design and construction of a 6,760 square foot addition of four additional classrooms and adjacent stairwell to the Marathon School. There are, there are two proposed sources of funding for this article in the motion. Most of the funding, $2,317,680, is, pro is proposed for borrowing and repayment of principal interest would be added to the tax bill outside the limits on tax in increase established by Proposition 2.5. That's what's called excluded debt in Massachusetts financial finance. Um, the second source of funding is $3.625 million is, is a pool of excess proceeds from the original marathon school construction process. This is an amount that was unspent on the original project and that is not available for town meeting to apply for another capital project. Because not all the money for this project will be borrowed at the beginning of the year, the projected fiscal year 2022 tax impact on the principal interest payments on this proposed debt is about $18 for a homeowner with Hopkinton's average house, which is valued at about $655,000. If the full amount were to be to be borrowed immediately, that projected tax impact for the principal and interest payments on the proposed debt would rise to about 47 for the average homeowner with a $655,000 home. Thank you. Are there questions about this article? Okay, seeing no questions, this does require a two-thirds majority. <clears throat> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? I have a question. Is there a question? Yeah, I, I have a question. How come if Marathon was just built, how come uh, it wasn't uh, built large enough to accommodate uh, these you, you need your name and street address. My name is Chris Wagner, 182 Hayden Road. Um, I was just wondering if Marathon was just built a few years ago, how come it wasn't built large enough to accommodate those additional classrooms along with um, the, the crowded Elmwood school that was proposed earlier. Uh, there's a detailed history behind this. I wonder if uh, um, either... Hi, Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street, uh, Chairman of the Elementary School Building Committee for Marathon School. Uh, when participating with the Massachusetts School Building Authority on school building projects, they require a very strict adherence to their methodology for approving uh, size of the school given current population. They do not allow uh, speculative uh, construction for what population may matriculate in future years. So with that in mind, the school building committee for a marathon school with approval from town meeting uh, built a school that came in uh, to achieve the needs of the population when it opened. Uh, we did so while also approving a design that, and a choosing a space where it was constructed to allow room for future expansion. 
we're now at that point. So we recommend uh, approval of this project because it is 100% consistent with the project that started with the construction of the school and included design for future expansion and also came in $4 million under what town meeting had initially uh, allocated. Thank you. What about the additional um, school that you're proposing for Elmwood? That, uh, that, that could have been included with... That's outside of the scope of this particular article. Right, but it's the same school system, I mean... I understand that, but we're, we're dealing with an article that, that specifically addresses an addition to Marathon School right now. <clears throat> so, again, let's go back. All those in favor of Article 17 as proposed, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and it's unanimous, which is good, because then we don't have to do our standing count to meet the two-thirds threshold. Thank you. Article 18. School HVAC renewal and digital control upgrade. Mr. Manning. Article 18, school HVAC re renewal and digital control upgrade. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Set, uh, this article provides $350,000 for the installation of a digital control system for the Hopkinton Middle School heating, ventilation, air conditioning system through a general obligation borrowing also requiring a citizen vote, allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And Mr. Tedstone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none. <clears throat> All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. And again, we avoid standing count. Article 19, Hopkins and Middle School Roof Replacement. Mr. Manning. Article 19, Hopkins, Hopkins Middle School Roof Replacement. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides $3 million to replace large portions of the roof at the Hopkins Middle School and significant sections of the roof at the Hop Hopkins Elementary School, doing this through general obligation borrowing and requiring a citizen vote and principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And Mr. Tedstone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Again, unanimous and so voted. Article 20, police station roof replacement. Mr. Manning. Article 20. Article 20, police station roof replacement. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. This article provides $250,000 for a full roof replacement of a failing 30-year life cycle roof on the Hopkinton Police Station, doing this through general obligation borrowing, also requiring a citizen vote, allowing principal and interest to be excluded from the taxation limits imposed by Proposition 2 and a half. Capital Improvements. The Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And Select Board. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Stephen Popkiss, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Uh, that's a fairly new building. Why is the roof, I mean, I've seen the roof. The roof clearly needs to be replaced. Why hasn't it lasted lo as long as we would expect? Who can speak to that? Town engineer. Here comes Dave. Good morning, uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. My name is David Del Torrio. I'm the town engineer. Um, we, we believe there's a ventilation issue uh, with the existing structure, um, which has caused the shingles to fail uh, prematurely. Does that help? Uh, one further question then, if that is the problem, uh, will we be fixing that issue as part of the new roof? 
yes, that's the intent. We will uh, investigate during a design phase um, and, and find the cause and uh, re repair it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. Article 21, Pratt Farm Wellfield. Mr. Manning. Article 21, Pratt Farm Wellfield. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides $195,000 for engineering work related to design, planning, engineering, permitting, eventual construction, and related costs for the Pratt Farm water field, well field to expand the town's water infrastructure resilience. This will be a general obligation borrowing uh, that will be from user fees raised in the Water Enterprise Fund. Capital improvements? Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And Mr. Ted Stone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Mr. Moderator, Ken Weiss, Middle 145 Ash Street. I don't see in the motion where it says it comes from user fees from the water system. I, maybe I'm just not understanding the chapters and sections that are listed here, but I don't see where that motion and even the next one says that. Mr. Manning or Town Council? Town Council. Town Council, Mr. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your breakfast. <laughs> Are we on? Okay, good morning. I'm sorry you're interrupting my breakfast as well. Um, Um, before I proceed, I just want to introduce, for those of you who don't know, to my right is my colleague Brian Bertram. To my left, my other colleague, Marisa Miller. They are the brains of, um, uh, of our operation today. Um, and uh, you may be hearing from one or the other of them if any further questions come up. So the reason the, um, uh, the articles are written this way is that when we borrow money, um, if we borrow, if we call them revenue bonds, we have to pay an higher, uh, a higher um, interest rate. If we call them general obligation bonds, um, then they are, um, uh, they have the full faith and credit of the, uh, of the town behind them, and we pay a lower interest rate. So while it is our intent to um, repay the borrowing through user fees. Uh, at the end of the day, the legal responsibility is, a, is the uh, general fund. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of Article 21 signify by... Oh. Wendy Zimmerman, 24 Cedar Street Extension. If it is the intent of the article for the general fund bond to be repaid from user fees, then I suggest an amendment that states that explicitly. Do you have a written amendment to provide? Uh, give me a minute and a pen. If you want to use this as an opportunity to get up and stretch for a moment, that would be okay.
Okay, we're about ready to get back underway. If we could start to take our seats again, please. Okay, we're ready to get back underway. Uh, Brian is going to read the amendment that has been provided. Uh, hello, everyone. So at the end of the motion, as it's written in the motions document, we would strike the period, add a semicolon, and following that, provided, however, that without creating any legal obligation, it is the intent of this motion that principal and interest payments for such borrowing shall be funded via user fees for water supply services. And, 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 it's, and it Second. has been seconded? Yes. Okay. And it, um, to counsel, it is clear that this would not do anything to affect the interest rate of any borrowing that would be done? That's correct, Mr. Moderator. Okay. <clears throat> so there has been an, uh, an amendment as it has been read to you. Is there any discussion relating to the amendment? Mr. Moderator, Ken Weissman on 145 Ash Street. One of my other volunteer duties is I serve as a water commissioner on the Water Resources Board for the Commonwealth. And one of the things that this board requires is that water systems have like an enterprise and, and don't, don't fund their, their portions out of general obligation funds. This amendment will uh, give that intent. That would be in uh, conformance with uh, Water Resources Commission policies, particularly as Hopkinton uh, does do interbasin transfers, and we do have uh, several of those. Uh, so we, this in, uh, motion, this amendment is uh, the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of incorporating this amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, now we're back to the motion uh, as amended. Is there any discussion on the entire motion as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Article 22, Grove Street Chlorine Injection. Mr. Manning. Article 23, Aprilla Farm Well. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles. No, I'm sorry. Article 22, Grove Street Chlorine Injection. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. This article, provi this article provides $300,000 for the installation of chlorine injection system at the Grover Street water tanks including spending for planning, engineering, design, and related work. This will be general obligation borrowing backed by the full faith credit of the town to obtain the lowest possible borrowing rate, but the principal and interest on this project will be paid from user fees raised in the Water Enterprise Fund. This will probably require the same amendment as the previous article. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. 
Mr. Tenstone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? I recommend the, set, the amendment again as we amended with the previous article. Is there a second? It's been seconded. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Council. And, any, if, um, first, is there any uh, downside to adding this same language to this particular article? Mr. Moderator, no, there's not. Okay. Would you read the, uh, the, the language of the amendment then? Yes. So it would be the same amendment at the end of the proposed motion, provided, however, that without creating any legal obligation, it is the intent of this motion that principal and interest payments for such borrowing shall be funded via user fees for water supply services. Okay. Any discussion of the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of incorporating this language through the amendment that's been provided signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now we need a vote on the uh, article as amended. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Article 22 as amended signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous, thank you. Article 23, Alperla Farm Well. <clears throat> Mr. Manning. Article 23, Alperla Farm Well. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article Mr. provides $40,000 for cleaning of wells seven and eight at the Alperla Farm Well field. This work will help maximize water supply volume and quality from those these two drinking water production wells. The cost will be paid from the Water Enterprise Fund retained earnings, which has a June 30th, 2020 balance of $991,343. These funds were generated completely from water user fees. Mr. Tenstone. Select Board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous, thank you. Article 24, Water Main Replacement, Woody Island Road. Mr. Manning. Article 24, Water Main Replacement, Woody Island Road. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides $280,000 for the replacement of the existing aging 900-foot cast iron water main at Woody Island Road. The cost will be paid from Water Enterprise Fund retained earnings which has a June 30th, 2020 balance of $991,343. These funds were generated completely from water user fees. Capital improvements. Capital improvements committee recommends approval. Mr. Tedstone. Select board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And unanimous and so voted, thank you. Article 25, Inflow and Infiltration Investigation. Mr. Manning. Article 25, Inflow Infiltration Investigation. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides $80,000 to continue work on investigation of water leaking into the municipal sewer system. The cost will be paid from the Sewer Enterprise Fund retained earnings, which has a June 30th, 2020 balance of $673,831. These funds were generated completely from sewer user fees. Capital improvements. Capital improvements committee recommends approval. And Mr. Tedstone. Select board recommends approval. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Thank you. <clears throat> Article 26, vehicle replacement. Article 26, vehicle replacement. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides $53,000 for the purchase of a replacement truck for the sewer department. The cost will be paid from Sewer Enterprise Fund retained earnings, which has a June 30th, 2020 balance of $673,831. These funds were generated completely from sewer user fees. 
Capital improvements? Capital improvements committee recommends approval. And Mr. Ted Stone. Select board recommends approval. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Article 27, Community Preservation Funds. Mr. Manning. Article 27, Community Preservation Funds. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. This article provides appropriation of reserve deposits totaling $1,446,119 for community preservation from estimated fiscal year 2022 property transfer surcharge taxes and matching state funds as follows. 10% for open space, $144,611. 10% for active passive recreation, $144,611. 10% for Historic Resources Reserve, $144,611. 10% for Community Housing Reserve, $144,611. And 60% for Budget Reserve, $867,675,000. These amounts per... The That's it. Capital improvements. Excuse me, community... <laughs> Let me start over. Select Board, Mr. Tedstone. Select Board recommends approval. CPC Committee. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator. Barely. Ken Weiss, 145 Ash Street, speaking as chair of the Community <laughs> Preservation Committee. Uh, we recommend approval. Is there any discussion on this first part of the CPC? Mr. Moderator. Yes. I would first like to thank Henry Kanicki, who served as the CPC chair for many years. Second, I'd like to thank all the members of the CPC committee who have been a delight to work with this year and all the organizations that have sought or received CPC funds. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the town hall staff, Shannon Soares, our uh, admin, the financial team, especially Ben Sweeney, and our town manager who have worked very hard and very closely with the CPC this year. We do recommend passage of this article to allocate our projected new funds. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, now we move on to the individual elements. Article 28, Community Preservation Recommendations. Mr. Manning. You're right, Mr. Wisemantle. <laughs> Mr. Ryder, Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street, speaking as the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. I move the uh, article, the first half of Article uh, 28, which is items A through, I think it's G. H. No. Uh, H is a Excuse separate me. vote. I okay. A through G, uh, as written in the motions uh, document. Uh, Mr. Ted Stone. Select board recommends approval. Mr. Manning. Appropriations committee recommends approval. And capital improvements. Mr. Moderator, the capital improvements committee recommends the seven items uh, on the first motion. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Weismantle. Mr. Moderator, <clears throat> the CPC is pleased to recommend these projects for funding from CPA funds. The CPC committee each year seeks potential projects, evaluates them leading up to this recommendation at town meeting in order to fund them. The projects support open space, including trails, recreation, community housing, and historic preservation. The CPC funds are 2% of our real estate taxes plus a state match, which could be as high as 30% this year. Uh, please note that we will be accepting grant requests 
until October uh, 14th of next year for next town meeting. I'm here to answer any questions on any of the projects that we recommend, and we urge your support of this article. Just to clarify, October 14th of, of this year for next year. Yes. Okay. Are there questions on any of the entries within um, this first motion relating to the use of CPC funds? Okay, seeing none, uh, this requires a simple majority. So all those in favor of uh, the elements under motion one, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Ken, uh, motion number two. Ken Weiss, middle 145 Ash Street, <clears throat> speaking as chair of the CPC. I move article 28, item H, uh, as written in the motions uh, document. This is the acquisition of a um, parcel of land that is a potential route for the Charles River Trail. Uh, our town manager negotiated a fair price with the owners that were willing to sell. Uh, this will link, is a potential link from the Milford Bike Trail to the Hopkinton State Park. I urge you to support this uh, article. Uh, it had to be separate because it's an acquisition of land that requires two thirds vote. Thank you. Are there any questions on this uh, particular element? All right, seeing none, again, it requires two-thirds. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. And we avoid another standing vote. Thank you. Now we're moving to zoning bylaw amendments, Article 29, Car Washes, Downtown Business District. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I'm over to your left. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street, speaking as the player of the Channing board, Planning Board, excuse me, Article 29, Car Washes, Downtown Business District. Uh, the planning board recommends approval. Uh, this article removes car washes as an allowable use in the downtown business district. Uh, car washes are currently allowed in the downtown business district, district by special permit, but 2019's annual town meeting indicated some desire to remove them. Are there any questions? Steve Pop, Steve Pop is 24 Cedar Street Extension. Uh, the, the car wash thing has been in place for a long time. Why are we deciding to remove it? Mr. Trendle. Uh, through the moderator, as I stated, um, we had considered uh, adding car washes as an audible use in one of the industrial districts in 2019. Um, and uh, as part of that discussion, we felt there was a desire among town meetings to remove it from the downtown business district. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of Article 29 signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous and so voted. All right, Article 30, Industrial B, District Housekeeping. Planning Board recommends approval. This article corrects the, number of, uh, the numbering in Article 8A so that it is consistent with the rest of our bylaws. Is there any discussion of thir Article 30? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 31, wireless telecommunications facilities. Yes, Article 31, wireless telecommunications facilities. Uh, the planning board uh, recommends uh, approval. Uh, this article updates the zoning bylaws to make them current with federal wireless, te wireless telecommunications regulations. Proposed modifications to existing towers that do not substantially change the physical dimensions will no longer require a special permit. Are there any questions about this article? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. All right, Article 32, Accessory Family Dwelling Unit. Uh, again, Planning Board recommends approval. This article updates the zoning bylaws related to accessory dwellings, Section 210.126. Uh, 
uh, e.g. an apartment connected to a single family home. There are several proposed changes. First, uh, it removes the requirement that occupants must be family related, quote, related by blood, marriage, or adoption, and removes the age restriction. Uh, there are many living situations that were previously not allowed that would be appropriate. Examples include caretakers, unmarried partners of adult children, adults with disabilities, etc. The second change is that it removes the requirement for an interior connection. This would allow for wholly separate living quarters and an independent structure to serve as an accessory dwelling. Uh, these are the only two changes associated with this proposal. Are there any questions? Steve Popkiss, 24 Cedar Street Extension. I just want a clarification here, because I'm looking on page 32, uh, deleting the current text of this record, replace it with the following, and that section there appears to very clearly require a related family member, so I'm confused by what you're saying. Uh, what we're doing is we're changing the definition uh, of related members so that it no longer requires them to be related by blood, marriage, or adoption. So what is the definition of additional family? And that without, with, I just want to know what you mean by it. What's that? Only if a member of the additional family is related to the owner of the premises. So I, I don't, you say, I hear you saying that the uh, a family member no longer needs to be those three categories, but there is a, de a reference to an additional family who's related to the owner. What does related mean? Does that include any? I, I just want to know what you're, what you're trying to say. Could yeah. Do you want uh, uh, Attorney Mieras to address that, Gary, or? Um, sure. Yes. At, at the risk of interrupting <laughs> either breakfast or coffee. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Um, so in the original language, um, the uh, accessory dwelling unit could only uh, be made available to an additional um, a family member who is related to the owner of the premises. This allows to accommodate a caregiver or a service provider. Um, if it's going to be an, uh, an additional family, um, the uh, the additional family is relate has to be related in some way to the owner of the premises. So the critic the critical phrase is additional family, presuming more than one individual. All right, that's correct. Jerry Tillett, Four Price Street. Oh, could I ask the planning board what definition of caregiver? and service provider you're using, where is that defined? Either through planning board or through uh, attorney Mieris, would you address that? I am quickly reviewing here. <clears throat> I, we have not defined that in this article. Um, I would state, though, that uh, as part of this process, that uh, this would still uh, require a special permit. That, that requirement does not change. So there is um, still abil some ability to review the circumstances uh, specifically for the, the special permit as it relates to the accessory dwelling. OK. Uh, my comment, uh, the thrust of this article, the purpose seems to me to be to open the accessory dwelling unit to occupancy by a caregiver or service provider. And the planning board or and the people who wrote this article have not defined either one of those. So as a member of the uh, appeals board, uh, board of appeals, not speaking for the board of appeals, but as a member, if someone comes to us for a special permit, 
they can define caregiver or service provider. And as a member of the board, I have nothing to guide me. In other words, it appears to me to be a blank check for the members of our community to establish dwelling units using whatever definition they can reasonably come up with. Could be a service provider to someone in another town, someone who used to be a service provider. Um, I would hope peop th this uh, meeting would reject this proposal. Uh, it, I, I don't see how a board could enforce it. Uh, I can see a lot of appeals to higher authorities if we deny anyone a request to build an accessory dwelling unit based on this article. Uh, thank you. Mr. Moderator? This is Mary Larson Marlowe, 238 Hayden Rose Street, <clears throat> chairperson of the Zoning Advisory Committee. Um, it was certainly a while ago that we discussed this particular article because it was presented for the previous town meeting. Um, but the intent of the changes to this article <clears throat> were to open up the ability for people to have accessory dwelling units that were not specifically for related individuals and to have it policed for that purpose. This is part of an effort to create more affordable housing spaces within the community. And this seemed like a very good place to start. Uh, Mr. Tom Terry had originally suggested that we review this article and consider it for, um, for some modification for that purpose. We also know that um, upon sale of houses that have an accessory dwelling unit, that although it says currently in the bylaw that um, it cannot be used for any other purpose than what was originally you know, approved, that there's a certain amount of an honor system for people because we don't have people going around uh, policing the exact occupants of these accessory dwelling units. Um, with that in mind, we wanted to remove the statement about related by blood um, adoption or marriage because there is a much broader definition of family in today's society. Um, we do not always, um, you know, people who can be partners for a long time without being married, and, um, and there can be um, extended um, uh, children um, who, who are essentially like foster children. Um, but the, the bylaw was not changed and we retained certain aspects of this is to make sure that these, um, these uh, accessory dwelling units do not change the nature of the home. Um, it still appears as a, um, as a um, single family dwelling. Staircases, if necessary, are on the, the back side, not visible to the street, that sort of thing. So the idea is to make um, young people or older people or um, caregivers for people um, a more affordable space within town and, um, and open it up appropriately within the community. I wonder if we could turn to town council to get clarification on the issue of how uh, clear or unclear the, the wording or concept of caregiver uh, might be. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, again, Brian Bertram from town council's office. Uh, we really do not um, take issue with using these terms. We think that they have um, enough specificity, particularly in the context of the rest of the town's zoning bylaws, that they have true meaning. 
Uh, we have many terms in our zoning bylaws um, that refer to persons, places, other things that don't have definitions. And it's not unusual in law to encounter that. And so what would happen is, is that if a situation arose, uh, the zoning enforcement officer would make a determination. Town council's office would be there to assist in that. Um, and we would use the normal tools available to us in doing that. But um, these are terms that um, we think have enough specificity that they don't need a, a separate definition. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any addi additional discussion on this article? <coughs> Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road. Um, I would like uh, clarification on how we will enforce whether this article will open up single family homes to be rental properties without the town or neighbors knowing. Thank you. Through the moderator. Through the moderator. Go ahead. Um, I don't think these changes impact how we enforce it. So uh, it's exactly the same as it was before, and candidly, it's somewhat difficult to enforce. Um, but th this doesn't change in any way uh, how this is enforced through the zoning enforcement officer to make sure that that uh, the properties are complying with the, the bylaw. Through the moderator. When we have the word family in there, um, it would make the article a little bit more enforceable. And so I would just like to have some clarification on um, when it's not family, how will you be able to have any teeth to your enforcement? Gary, was this, uh, was this topic addressed in the public meetings that you held on this article? I, I guess I'd, maybe if you could clarify your question, because I'm not sure if it's related to single family homes being converted into rentals or if it has to do with uh, additional accessory dwellings being used, if you could clarify. It, it is the additional accessory dwellings um, within the single family homes that I'm concerned about being um, converted into uh, rental type properties as opposed to truly staying single family homes. And when it was family, um, there gave a little bit more restriction to the idea that you were caring for your people within your extended family family as opposed to, and then the town would have no um, ability to say to those folks, that is not a rental property, that's not the intent of the law. That is really what I'm concerned about. Yeah, so, so through the moderator, we, we did discuss it at length, and, and again, the challenge is, is that it's, even in its current form, it's really hard to enforce. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I don't know, you know, does having the word family related by blood uh, strengthen it and, and give us some ability, yes, but uh, I think there's there's still some substantial limitations to, to how we can enforce these these types of, of policies. So, on my left, is thank you, Mr. Moderator, Tom Terry from 17 Maple Street. Um, I'd just like to comment that the um, Zach group that Mary is with and the planning board have done a lot of work on this over the past four or five years. It's been hemmed and hawed. And I think they've got it narrowed down to a, a warm and friendly situation that will make us a better town, and I fully support it. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of Article 32 as written, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, since it's two-thirds, I think we might as well use this as an opportunity to, to uh, take a standing vote. So all those in favor signified by, well, stand, stand with your yellow cards. <clears throat> the 
three in the staff tent. Sorry, correction, four in the staff tent. Thirteen on the stage, in favor. Mr. Moderator, set a right twenty nine. Center right twenty nine. Center and left of the tent, 50, 5, 0. 5, 0, 79, and 13, 92. Okay, uh, do we have everyone counted on, on, on in the tent in favor? And if you, um, you can take your seats. All those opposed, stand with your cards. in the staff tent. Center right two. Center and right or left, that, that side, anyhow. Uh, five, Ten. Five. Five. Okay, so there are five on the stage. So 92 in favor, 12 opposed, and that's uh, better than a two thirds majority. Are we ready for Article 34? Uh, Article 33. Nonconforming lots, uses, and structures. Excuse me, yes. Uh, Article 33, <coughs> nonconforming lots, uses, and structures. The Planning Board recommends approval. Uh, this article would allow for a waiver by the Zoning Enforcement Officer for modifications to nonconforming lots that do not alter the footprint or overall height of the pre existing structure in certain situations. For example, uh, if someone had a house and wanted that was uh, in that, that they wanted to add dormers uh, and it currently didn't conform to the bylaws but was a pre-existing structure, um, then by not changing the height and not changing the footprint, it would uh, be eligible for a waiver by the zoning enforcement officer. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So unanimous and so voted. Article 34, temporary signs. All right, Article 34, temporary signs, Planning Board recommends approval. Uh, this article allows expanded use of temporary signs for businesses impacted by construction, such as the Main Street Corridor, Main Street <clears throat> Corridor Project. It would allow four signs within 600 feet of the location, and it removes the uh, restriction for temporary signs of 30 days. Any questions? Oh. Gary, can, can you make that in the form of a motion? Yes. Just 
move it as printed. Uh, we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 34 of the 2021 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Okay. All right, seeing notice. Mr. Weissmantle. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. <clears throat> I thought due to a recent Supreme Court ruling that you could not regulate signs based on their purpose. This seems to say a lot of business purposes. And that seems to be in contrary to why we rewrote the sign bylaw a few years ago. Would town council please explain that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Brian Bertram again. So uh, you're correct. There was a recent Supreme Court decision, although I suppose it's not so recent at this point, Reed v. Gilbert, um, that did strike down a sign in Arizona that was um, content specific. I would note, however, that that um, bylaw in question applied to all speech in the town. Uh, this bylaw revision applies to commercial speech. And there are Supreme Court precedents that lessen the level of scrutiny or, or the level of it gives more government control to things that regulate solely commercial speech as opposed to all speech, you know, all speech having more protection. So uh, it's incredibly difficult right now to predict exactly what's going to happen in the First Amendment context, but um, certainly the lesser standards and more government control over commercial speech remain on the books. We believe they endure. So we think that um, this really modest regulation on commercial speech would satisfy those standards. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of this article signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, unanimous and so voted, thank you. <clears throat> article 35, commercial solar photo photovoltaic installations. So, so, Mr. Moderator, what I'd, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, is, uh, is quickly review Articles 35 and 36 before we get to the specific uh, motions and discussion. Please, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, you'll note in your packet that you have a, a very short packet of information with regards to these articles. Um, there's a couple <laughs> things to take a look at. The first is an FAQ that covers both Article 35 and Article 36. Uh, and then the second is an executive summary that highlights both uh, what they change uh, and what stays the same. And then the last part of it is a, uh, a map that shows uh, the proposed overlay uh, for the overlay district. Just a little bit of background. Currently in Hopkinton, we have approximately 19 acres of commercial ground mounted solar panels and we have an additional 45 acres that is approved but not yet built. Uh, in my experience on the planning board, these commercial solar projects are some of the most challenging to review as they have a substantial impact, often in residential areas, uh, and yet they receive a very high level of advocacy from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And in fact, commercial solar um, per the state is to be, allow is to be an allowable use in all zones, uh, and specifically towns may not prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems. The Planning Board has recommended that Town Meeting move forward with two uh, zoning articles. It's important to note that neither article makes any change to solar as an accessory use. So for example, if you want to put it on your rooftop, you can still do that in any zone. Um, so that accessory, will, accessory use will continue to be allowed in all zones. It's also worth noting that these articles are independent of one another, meaning that Town Meeting can approve one, both, or neither of them. So I'll just quickly talk to Article 35 first. This article is a, a rewrite of our existing commercial solar bylaw. It's really focused on strengthening the existing bylaw by effectively eliminating the visual impact of these ground-mounted commercial solar photovoltaic systems. Uh, if approved, it will require a site plan review for all commercial solar projects, and currently it's just a special permit that's required. Uh, it will ensure year-round visual screening, visual shielding for the life of the project. 
Uh, it will optimize wildlife and trail utilization with requirements for things like wildlife friendly fencing and requiring that trails be relocated within said parcels. It will be pollinator friendly uh, and it will also add some additional requirements for developers to ensure compliance, including sightline analysis, glare analysis, noise analysis, uh, full landscaping plans, uh, and bonding to support uh, maintenance of those things in the future. That's a quick summary of Article 35, and I'm just going to quickly talk about Article 36 as well. Uh, Article 36 is a supplement to the commercial solar bylaw, and it creates an overlay district that determines on which specific parcels solar can be installed. This article was uh, originally on the 2020 town meeting warrant, but we recommended no action given the pandemic circumstances. You'll see on the map in your packet the parcels that we opted include to include. It consists primarily of parcels that already have commercial solar built out or approved or already approved for, with the addition of the 495 corridor and a, a Harvey property that is uh, not forested. We did consider multiple other properties at the request of landowners throughout <clears throat> the hearing process, and it was a very lengthy hearing process, um, but opted to start with a relatively narrow list with the option to add more parcels in the future. Uh, however, it's worth noting that new parcels, while they can be added in the future, it would require uh, approval at annual town meeting to do so. And then lastly, other towns in Massachusetts have enacted similar overlay districts. Uh, Wellesley and Weston are two of those communities. Town Council has been very involved and we're very grateful for their engagement on the creation and review of both articles. Um, and might be unwise for me to try and speak on their behalf, but I'm going to attempt to summarize uh, the feedback that we've gotten from them. For Article 35, Town Council anticipates that what we are proposing will keep within the state guidelines while also affording the improvements to our bylaws that we are looking for. Uh, for Article 36, Town Council's guidance is not quite so clear. Uh, while they, uh, in their statement to us, while they anticipate the Attorney General's office would approve the overlay district if it passes our town meeting, they caution that it could be challenged in court. Uh, without any current case law, it's very hard to predict how a court challenge might go. So to, court, to quote town council, uh, Hopkinton would need to offer a justification for how the overlay protects public health, safety, or welfare. And then my last point, one of the, the reasons that Article 35 mm -hmm. is particularly important to us uh, is that if Article 36 were challenged in court, uh, we would still have all the improvements uh, included in Article 35 if it passes. Thank you, Gary. I'd ask you now to make a, a motion related to Article 35. Yes. <clears throat> Point of order, Mr. Mo moderator. Shall I go ahead and make the motion, or do you want to take the point of order? No. Nope. Was there a point of order or just? Y yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, Brown Nation, 43 Smith Road. Go ahead. Um, we're, there's a number of people out here thinking that, um, that we don't have a quorum. Well, we need to do a count then. If, if, you, if his motion is that yeah. you'd like to call for a Would you like to call for a, um, a count? Yes, sir. All right. We're going to do a physical count of the yellow cards. So if, uh, if you would either rise or stand with your, uh, with your yellow cards visible, we'll do a count to confirm a quorum. Center right, 31. What did I say, 23? 
Uh, please, please give me that on the in, on the tent again. <clears throat> Center right, thirty one. Thank you. So far, Brian, significant that amount. Brian, that mic is live. <laughs> yeah, that mic is live. That's a dollar. I would check this bet. Tent center 47. Tent center 47. <laughs> Does that uh, cover everyone under the tent then? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I've got 101. Okay, so we uh, we have 101. Though you you can sit for the moment. So we. Uh, we don't have to adjourn. We can if there are any other articles that are simply reports. We can hear reports. Why don't we take a quick look at? I don't think that all is, of our bylaws. They're all bylaws down. No, oh, even even through. <clears throat> yes, we can. We can do that. Uh, we were just talking. Council. Well, so everything re requires action. Yeah, so, so it's either we either wait or we adjourn. Yeah, let's do that. Guys, we need to get people here. We should announce that everyone should bring people in. Yeah. <clears throat> so as it stands, because the because the um, quorum requirement is 117, we are at the moment short of a quorum. We have 101 voters. Uh, so what I would propose is this. Uh, it's now roughly 12 o'clock? 12 o'clock exactly. 12 o'clock exactly. Uh, for those of you who are at home, we're, we're going to adjourn for 30 minutes. F for those of you who are home, uh, in order for us to continue the town meeting, uh, since the, the remaining articles all do require votes, it's not simply accepting information, we do need to meet our quorum of 117. Uh, I'm going to propose that we adjourn for 30 minutes in hopes that we can attract uh, at least another 16 people, ideally a few more, so that we can maintain our quorum and continue our business. Uh, if we do not meet the quorum requirement by 1230, we will have to adjourn, and the adjournment will be for one week. So again, what I'm, what I'm imploring uh, townspeople to do is uh, to come to the football field, check in, and help us to uh, reach quorum again so that we can continue and finalize the meeting. Thank you. Shut, shut up. Oh, here is. Yes, is this, is this uh, within the, the laws of the uh, town meeting that we can do this? Is the town council uh, in accord of this uh, movement? Uh, under town meeting times, if, if a quorum is called and a quorum is not met, we have a couple of options, one of which is to adjourn, one is, one is to adjourn uh, temporarily, adjourn for a week, or simply hear reports. We have no, no more reports to hear. So the options are adjourned temporarily or adjourned to, uh, to next Saturday at this point. My, my question would be, um, are the votes that are coming in from home qualified? We all checked in. We uh, designated our, they have our, to our precinct, and uh, they, they looked at us, and they saw who we were. Yeah. Is this, a, this is a precedence that's never had 
taken place before in this town. No, they still, they still have to check in. They well, still they're going to gonna have to come up here. Yes, correct. Oh, how long are you going to allow that to happen? Until 12.30. So if at 12.30, you have, then you're going to take a full new, a new count completely? Correct. So the ones that are stepping out now should not step out if they want to, or if they wanted to lessen the vote, they should go home. Uh, <laughs> I would ask that people stay on the grounds. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do our count for those of you who are with us and who are registered voters, please hold your cards up so that uh, the counters can see that you're here. Twenty three on the stage. Center right fifty five zero. Center right fifty. And so we continue. Mr. Trendle, a motion for Article 35. All right, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, again, Article 35, just to remind those people that might have missed the previous conversation, this would uh, require a site plan review for all commercial solar projects. It will ensure year-round visual shielding for the life of the project. It will optimize wildlife and trail utilization. It will be pollinator friendly and it will add some additional requirements for developers to ensure compliance, uh, including sightline analysis, glare analysis, noise analysis, full landscaping plan and bonding. So the planning board uh, 
moves that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws uh, as set forth in Article 35 of the 2021 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Okay, discussion on my right. Mr. Moderator, Brian Herr, Hayden Rose Street. Uh, I'm a professional in the solar development industry. I support Article 35 as written. I'll be back for Article 30, 36 for different reasons. Thank you. Steve Pafkas, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Um, I was glad that this gentleman spoke up because that was my first question. Has any commercial operators have been consulted on this? It still seems to me quite onerous and overkill for what it does. For example, there's a noise analysis, and I don't quite understand how that would work with solar since it produces no noise once it's established, so that argues to me that it's for construction. And I don't know if, our, and I, oh, I'll ask this as a question. Are any other construction projects required to do a noise analysis prior to a start? Mr. Trendle. Um, so with regards to the noise analysis, part of it also has to do with the uh, clear cutting that may occur as associated with this. So there could be some changes in uh, noise thresholds, um, whether, uh, you know, even, even though the, the solar itself might not be making any noise. Um, as for your question about are any other construction projects required to do noise assessments, I'm deferring to my expert here, our principal planner. Uh, it is uh, our understanding that there are, it is not a requirement, but they can be asked for as part of the conditions uh, associated with an approval. One more statement, and then I'll get off. The uh, every development involves cutting down trees. Okay, so this is in uh, no way any different from any other development, and I would argue it's a considerable overkill for what you if you were trying to essentially basically generate code for solar. There's a lot of things in here that I would argue are unnecessary and I think are directed to limit or eradicate commercial solar from Hopkinton. So I recommend voting against it. Is there any additional discussion? Uh, town Council wants to comment. Uh, I think good afternoon to everyone now. I just wanted to um, first take a moment to reiterate uh, what you heard from the planning board chair. Uh, town council's office was involved in the drafting of this. Um, there was considerable back and forth. Um, and so, you know, we're pretty comfortable with all the provisions. There's just um, one minor point that I did want to flag. And that is in section, the proposed new section 210-204, which deals with pesticides, herbicides, and synthetic fertilizers item A, um, we, there are past instances where the municipal law unit of the Attorney General's office has disapproved of specific provisions attempting to regulate pesticides and herbicides um, because those are subject to comprehensive state regulation. So this would not, we, we, we do not believe in any way this would endanger the entire proposed bylaw, but only that specific item. There is a, there's a possible chance, perhaps a likely one, that that would be disapproved. Um, but everything else we reviewed and we are comfortable with. On my left. Ken Weissmantle, 145 North Pole. <laughs> uh, 145 Astrid, I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically on 35, I kind of support the concept of regulating it. The problem is my support of the concept of regulating solar and actually having solar be a much better neighbor than sometimes they currently is, is completely opposite of the policy in the laws of the Commonwealth. I think we're gonna get in trouble. We're gonna be in, in, in legal aspect when we pass uh, Article 35 today. That's just my opinion. Uh, we certainly will be probably in trouble when we pass 35 and 36 together, which really makes it clear that the intent of Hopkinton is not to have any additional solar uh, 
facility, uh, commercial solar facilities in, in the town of Hopkinton. Uh, I'm going to support and vote for this one just because I think solar folks could be better neighbors. I have a feeling we're going to lose everything when we get soon. On my right. Uh, Andrew Singer, 16 Alexander Road. Just a quick comment, if I may, about the sound, about the noise. Uh, prior to the solar going in on Lumber Street, uh, we occasionally heard traffic from 495 when it was raining in the evening. Uh, now we hear truck noise from uh, 495 on a regular basis. And so it's, I believe, the trees coming down um, the lack of cover, and we hear the sound a lot. Thank you. On my left. Hi, Francis DeYoung, 3 Doyle Lane. I am in favor of this proposal. I'm a member of the planning board, but I'm speaking as a private citizen. I think what this does is it provides some standards for the board, um, as well as developers, to be cognizant of. And I think it's, um, a lot of work that was done by Zach, um, as well as town council and the planning board to review uh, the elements of this proposal. And I think there's been a lot of thought and consideration to all parties involved. So I would just, again, uh, express my support for 35. Thank you. Go ahead. Jeff Doherty, Three Angels Way. Um, I have a... Uh, uh, I want to commend the planning board and the subcommittee that worked so hard to put this together. And I'm, I'm fully in support of the concept and the idea. But I think, um, as one of the previous speakers said, that this is overkill. It's so restrictive. I mean, in, in Section 210.204, pesticides and herbicides alone one of the requirements of this bylaw is to grow grass underneath a solar panel array. When you don't have sunshine and you're going to restrict synthetic fertilizers, I don't see how you're going to get grass to grow. So now you're going to limit the person that's going to put this in and in the installer to use compost or some organic material to grow grass. Um, and that's just one, one specific point in this. Uh, lighting requirement. I mean, we have, we have a lighting bylaw, and the first building on South Street just changed their lighting, put up LED fixtures that are supposed to point down, according to the planning board's ruling and their bylaw. And the new lighting that went in shines right into 495 as you're coming off the ramp. It's blinding. So, you know, and there's no limitation there. So th I think it's overkill. I think it's too restrictive. But I certainly am in support of the concept. I think this article needs more work. Uh, Jeff, we note under 210-204 that uh, pesticides, herbicides, defoliants, and synthetic fertilizers can be used if it is with the approval of CONCOM and or the planning board. So it's not an absolute prohibition. It does require approval of the other two boards, just as a matter of clarification. On my right. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. I speak in support of this article as written. Okay, S seeing no further discussion, it's time for a vote. <clears throat> All those in favor of Article 35 as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, because it requires a two-thirds majority, we will uh, engage in a count. So if you are in favor, please stand with your yellow cards.
22 on the stage. Center right, 44. 44 center right. Center and left is sixty six zero. Six zero for a total of one twenty six. Okay. All those opposed, please rise and hold your yellow cards up. Zero on the stage. <laughs> Center right eight. Center right eight. Center and left is six. Six, thank you. Total of 14, so it's 126 in favor, 14 opposed. Uh, clearly a two thirds majority. Thank you. Uh, be Gary, before you start, I'm going to turn uh, the meeting over to Deputy Moderator Muriel Kramer for Articles 36 through 38. Okay, Mr. Trundle, 36. All right, thank you, Ms. Moderator. Uh, Article 36, just to remind folks, this is a supplement to the commercial solar bylaw. It would create an overlay district that determines on which specific parcels solar can be installed. Those parcels are identified on the map in your meeting packet. So the board, uh, excuse me, the planning board moves that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 36 of the 2021 annual town warrant meeting warrant. Any uh, any questions from the audience? Oh, what? what are we? I thought somebody said something. On my left. Okay, Stephen Popkus, 24 oh. Cedar Street. On my right. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Go ahead, Mr. Popkus. Steve Popkus, 24 Cedar Street Extension. Um, yeah, the first one didn't say that Hopkinton is against commercial solar, this one certainly does. 
Uh, it's very interesting. The um, overlay that we were given for the uh, schools showing the open space and the areas of proposed development uh, very nicely does not overlap particularly well with the uh, open space uh, suggested for the overlay, which argues that basically we cannot, we're not allowing, this article does not allow our solar, commercial solar farms to compete with residential. The nice thing about solar, the thing that help, makes it worth so much to us over and beyond its power generation is the fact that four acres of, of solar power are two houses that aren't there that are no, no kids going, no additional kids to go into school, no additional fire and uh, police services, no additional water, all sorts of things. I look at a solar field and I get excited. I don't see any aesthetic problem whatsoever. It's, to me, that is another school we don't have to build. So I would argue that the overlay as constructed in this uh, uh, bylaw and which would have to be amended by a two-thirds majority in the future, actually puts us in the position of having solar in one area and all the residential development fully accessible. When we should be really be putting them in competition with one another, so a person says, I don't really want to, uh, to put in a subdivision here, but I've got to do something with my land because otherwise it's costing me money. They can say, oh, I can put solar on that land. No houses. No new school. So I strongly suggest we do not vote for this one. I strongly suggest this be voted down. Thank you. On my left. Ken Weiss, Middle 145 Ash Street. If we adopt this article, we're asking for a lawsuit because anyone that wants to build it is going to have to sue us to do it. And while they're going through the expense of suing us just to see if they could put it on a certain parcel, they're going to just challenge the, the um, bylaw that we just passed the previous article. And it's going to be a twofer for the seller developer that's, char that's uh, challenging us. Second point I'd like to make is 495 is state property. State property. They're not asking Hopkinton whether you have any permission. If they want to put panels on along 495 or the Mass Pike, they're just going to do it. Yeah. You know, they built that whole facility to, for the highway uh, traffic folks off near the exit. They didn't get a, get a building permit or a site plan from the town of Hopkinton. They just built it because the Commonwealth has the authority to do it. So allowing the state to put solar panels on 495 is kind of like saying to the king that he can do something. I did a, a study this last summer about taking my electric house to go solar. Sound like a great idea. Until they found out that the average, I would take 53 panels to take an electric house to make it go solar. And you know, 53 panels doesn't fit on the top of my roof. Uh, so basically, while we're all supposed to be all excited about going green, but we're not going to go green in Hopkinton. And I think this really says the wrong message. Uh, I think it ought to be permitted strongly, and I, and I encourage some of the stuff that was in 30, uh, or 35 before that. But you can't prohibit this. I mean, that, the Commonwealth has got policies where I believe it's 25, 30% of your electric bill in the next couple of years has got to come from uh, alternate energy sources. You know, I want to, I want heat for my house. I want the lights to turn on, et cetera. And you know, it's going to have to go somewhere. And why should it just not go in Hopkinton if we're requiring this for the whole Commonwealth? Thank you. On my right. Madam moderator, with article 35 in place, which creates uh, additional uh, requirements oh. for solar developers. And Mr. Land. Herr. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian Herr. Um, <laughs> where am I? Uh, Hayden Rose Street. Uh, sorry. Uh, but with 35 in place, that cr creates a lot more requirements for solar developers to do good solar, what I believe to be good solar. Uh, and as a professional in the solar development industry, uh, Article 36 clearly misses the mark. Article 36 will invite lawsuits. Uh, Article 36 is not widely supported by town council. 
it was a very pleasant way of saying it's a, that we have a different look at our view of the Article 36 in general. Uh, Article 36 basically says you can develop solar inside inside the median of 495. There is solar, to Mr. Weissmantel's point, along the Mass Pike. It is not in the median of the Mass Pike. It's in a couple of the interchanges, but it's not in the median. It's not in the median for a reason. You can't get the power out from the median to either side of the highway where the power is consumed or connected to the grid. You'd have to trench under 495, or you'd have to put wires up above 495 in order to move that power to a, a usable area, if you will. That is a crazy responsibility to put on a solar developer. That by the state, in my, in my view, my professional view, that would be viewed by the state as an unreasonable restriction on solar in the town of Hopkinton, and I think it would get shot down through the lawsuits that would likely come. So uh, for a lot of different reasons, I'll try to be brief here. Put this overlay district uh, is a bad bylaw for the town of Hopkinton, and I would strongly encourage town meeting voters, town meeting voters not to support it Article 35 gives us a lot more protections, a lot of screening requirements. It's going to create good solar in Hopkinton. This is just going to create law, law, lawsuits and an awful lot of expense for the town. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. Uh, everyone's making really good points, but I stand in favor of Article 36 and an overlay district. All you have to do is drive down Alexander Road and see where they put in a solar farm behind, behind beautiful houses that used to have nice views out of their backyard. I understand that um, the gentleman who rose and said, well, we should have competition between uh, subdivision developments and solar farms. At least with subdivision developments, uh, often many trees will be left and people who are buying homes want to landscape and put in trees. Uh, trees provide oxygen. Every, for every seven adult trees, it provides enough oxygen for one human being to uh, breathe for a year. Trees also eliminate carbon monoxide from the atmosphere. Um, they produce water, and they provide shelter from the sun, um, from the wind, and from the noise. And with solar farms, they come in and they just tear down acres and acres of trees. And I think that we need to look at how many trees could we lose uh, if we allow uncontrolled solar farms to go in, in spite that they might have um, screening around them that doesn't eliminate or minimize the impact of the trees that have been cut down. So um, do your homework. Solar power is good but it needs to be controlled. And please write also at the state level, they give too much power to developers and local communities do not have enough right to say what should go in and what not should go in. Uh, in terms of lawsuits, if there is precedence with communities determining overlay committees and those have gone through, if we are afraid of a lawsuit for everything we pass, we wouldn't pass anything. So again, I encourage the good citizens of Hopkinton to support Article 36. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Jeff Doherty, Three Angels Way. Um, uh, I recognize that the planning board has done a lot of work. They did their homework on Article 35. Yes, I agree with the previous speaker. The science is real, but I own property in an agricultural district a mile from 495. Now you're saying that I can't put solar in. That's taking away my property owner rights and it's taking away my retirement. I've lived in this town for 65 years. I've supported so many different projects. This is going to take something away from me. And I'm not in favor of this article. I oppose it. I think it's exclusionary. I think it's segregation to put something in a specific area. I appreciate what the planning board's trying to do, but I think it's way overkill. You've done your homework on 35. 36 is going to strip property owner rights. Thank you. On my left. Ben Churko, 147 Lumber Street. Uh, as a previous uh, speaker just said, property zone agricultural 
the land is zoned agricultural, you might see a farm if you don't put solar in it. If it's zoned residential, you're gonna see single family homes. And I know there was a lot of discussion earlier about taxes and new schools and repairs. I just wanna ask the question from the school committee or school department, what's it cost to educate a student and how many single family, how many students come out of a single family home on the average? What kind of numbers are we talking about? Please, thank you. Amanda Fargiano, chair of the school committee. Uh, the current cost per pupil expenditure is roughly $15,000. It's in the packet um, that Dr. Kavanaugh spoke to on the budget. And I think it is roughly 0.6 uh, students per household. Thank you. On my right. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road. Um, this is for through the moderator for Gary. Does Article 35 give the planning board an absolute right to say no to a solar farm? Asking a question about 30. She did say 35. But. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, through the moderator, uh, no, it does not give the planning board the right to say absolute no. Um, we, if it conforms to the bylaws, um, and there aren't any waiver requests and whatnot, then, you know, there's still a, then, then it, it was required to go through. And uh, another point of clarification then, so Article 36 allows us to say no to solar farms that might be in a, 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 an inopportune place in our town by creating the overlay. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, so through the moderator, the Article 36 of the overlay would only allow commercial ground-mounted solar photovoltaic in the parcels that are identified in the map. So if you, if it was, if you owned a property that was not identified on that map, um, then, and you wanted to develop solar, then first you'd have to go to annual town meeting and add that parcel to the map, and then uh, you could go through the, the application process. Um, also worth noting that None of this affects accessory use. So if you wanted to put solar panels over a parking lot or uh, on a roof or some other accessory use, it would have no impact on that. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Stacy Spies, 16 Alexander Road. Uh, there's um, some uh, misunderstandings of how things are currently zoned. Um, uh, for example, the solar farm that uh, is on Lumber Street was zoned agricultural. There was were not going to be residences there. Um, so it's not in either solar farms or houses uh, that would impact schools. Um, in fact, a lot of these properties are already Excuse zoned. me, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna yeah. ask the town council for clarification on that because I don't think that's correct. Okay. Agricultural can That was zoned ag. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, in terms of the zoning, I think approximately half of the town, a little bit more is zoned agricultural, and residential is permissible on ag in agricultural zones. So is that, because, uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, yeah, I yeah. understand. Many of the town's home, homes are on, on land that's zoned agricultural, and that's permissible in the zoning by Oh, okay, well that's, in case of that, that was not, um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is a lot of these parcels that I believe are coming up are zoned ag. Um, also, um, wait, no, I forgot my second point. Um, oh, also, the second point I wanted to make was, although these are local facilities producing solar, and I know Massachusetts is working hard to um, uh, definitely increase uh, where the, uh, solar power and other wind power and other alternative methods, the solar being produced locally does not necessarily stay local. So if one is of the mind that, oh, we should keep things in Hopkinton because, you know, that power will go. The power's gonna go out to whatever aggregator. Um, it, so it's not necessarily helpful to us. I mean, it's a global thing, but not locally. Uh, so I am in, in support of 36. Thank you. Thank you. Also on my left. Eric Sonnet, 60 Teresa Road. I stand in favor of this article. I've seen destruction of 
few sheds. I've seen uh, completely irresponsible solar. And quite frankly, I think this article addresses it. It does not take away an individual's opportunity to have solar. It just makes the town part of the process by forcing a town meeting vote to be included so that the property can be included in the overlay map. In addition to that, I'm not concerned about uh, legal or being sued. If it's good enough for Weston and Wellesley, <laughs> why isn't it good enough for us? That said, I support the article. Thank, Thank you. you. On my right. Janine LeBlanc, Three Scar Lotta Road. Actually, that may have already been my question. Um, do we, there's been a lot of discussion about it's too restrictive and there will be legal challenges. Do we have data that there are other towns that have a restrictive overlay district and has it been challenged? This explanation is going to take a little bit of time because the planning board chair was not wrong when he said that our guidance was less than clear. But um, that's mostly because there's not a lot of what we call case law or decisions from the court to give us much guidance on this. So I want to make sure the town meeting understands there's really two discrete issues when it comes to this type of overlay district. Uh, the first is whether it's permissible at all. In other words, whether it's you know per se unlawful. Um, we are aware of three land court cases that have addressed or at least talked about the issue. The two earlier ones seem to suggest that they are, and as you know, there are overlay districts in other towns. Uh, the most recent, however, which was a decision um, in the land court in 2019, said that any attempt <laughs> to prohibit uh, these types of facilities based on zoning, whether it's by district or overlay district or what have you, is per se unlawful. You can't do it. And our problem is, is that we don't have what we call an appellate level decision, one that binds all of the courts to tell us what the future is going to hold. So we basically have three court decisions that seem to disagree and no real rule to go by. So that's, that's issue one. Issue two is, is if they are allowed, then the question becomes whether what you've done is reasonable. Because the statute, Chapter 40A, Section 3, requires that all solar regulation is reasonable. And I, I think I can put it most simply, uh, our advice is, is that when you look at the map, the more land that's included in the overlay district, the better your chance is that a court's gonna say it's a reasonable restriction rather than an unreasonable one. We're not aware of any other overlay district that's been challenged on that basis, so we really have no data to offer you in terms of how that might fare. So. The best we can tell you is that yes, you know, if you pass this, there is certainly a risk of litigation. There's going to be two discrete legal issues we have to face. There's going to be arguments on both sides that, you know, are are not um, that that are good arguments. And, you know, I I think on item one, it's hard hard to really say because we have multiple different um, court decisions. On item two, when we look at the amount of land that's in the solar district, we have some concern that there's not enough and that a court may find it unreasonable. But again, we have no basis to tell you for certain that that's what would be decided uh, or that the town wouldn't have an argument if it came to that. On my left. Yes, Madam Moderator, thank you. Uh, the question was about getting the legal opinions into it, oh. and it seems as though we've answered them. Mr. So Terry, could you introduce yourself and your address? Oh, please? Tom Terry, 17 Maple Street. Thank you. Um, I was rising to ask the legal questions that you just answered most of them, and it seems that we need some more time maybe with this to see how some of these decisions play out rather than spend money in court. It seems as though Article 35 has done what most people probably would like to see done. Maybe we should put this aside for a few years or a couple of years and see how it does with some of the challenges that it might receive in court. I rise against this article. Thank you. On my right. 
uh, Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane, Chairman of the Open Space Preservation Commission, and I'm just going to suggest if you've got property, we'd be happy to take it. Thank you. <laughs> On my left. I rise to call the question. Point of information. <laughs> yeah, could, could you introduce yourself, sir? <laughs> Moderator, this is Tom Garavidi in 5 Davenport Lane. <laughs> so that, uh, that motion is always in order. Um, I, uh, all those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, it clearly passes, so we are uh, ready for a vote. Um, we're going to do a standing count vote for this one. All those in favor of Article 36, please rise with your yellow voting sticker. We have five on the stage. Center right, 34. 34 on the right. Tent, center and left, 43. Center and left, 43. Thank you. All those opposed, please rise and hold your yellow voting sticker. Seventeen, no on the stage. Center right, 18. Center right, 18. Tent, center and left, 24. Center and left, 24. Fifty 
I'm waiting corroboration. Or? I know. Did we get 59 for the second one? Uh, the, the article fails. There were 72, I'm sorry, 82 yes, 59 no. And we are ready for Article 37. Madam the Madam petitioner. Tom Garabedian, 5 Davenport Lane. I'm here to talk trash. <laughs> Uh, and before I, uh, I, I do want to move the motion, but I want to amend the motion at the same time. Specifically, and I've provided language to town council. Uh, line 11, rubbish disposal. I want to amend the uh, wording to say rubbish disposal may be provided by the town, as opposed to will be provided by the town. <laughs> And I would appreciate a second. Second. Um, speaking to the entirety of this of this uh, article, uh, I don't believe that it is as a resident within a, a condominium. Excuse complex, me, Mr. Garabedian. I'm going to encourage town meeting voters to please hang in there and stay with us so we can maintain our quorum. Sorry. Please go ahead. As a resident within a condominium complex, having been a, a single, uh, having been in a single family home prior to moving in, um, I don't believe that it is appropriate that uh, the provision of waste management and recycling should be within the zoning bylaw. This change, uh, if Article 37 is amended, is adopted would leave it to the, the town, select board, DPW and whatnot, to determine whether uh, garden apartments in residential districts and village housing in residential districts could be allowed to have town provided waste management and recycling services. I, I believe that uh, it's better placed in front of the select board and, and DPW to determine who should be the recipient uh, recipient of these town provided services. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Trendle from the Planning Board. A recommendation. Uh, the Planning Board recommends disapproval of this article. To my right. Mrs. No. Lafreniere, do you have questions? Yes. Mary Jo Lafreniere, 18 Walkup Valley Drive, Hoppington. Um, I live in a condominium complex, and this has come up before a town meeting two or three times in the past, and it has been voted down. And I do believe that a number of other issues have come up because of it, and it is that most of these streets in garden apartments and condominium complexes are, are not accepted town streets. so. Uh, is there an insurance problem? Um, and then it goes on and it goes on, well, they don't get plowed. <laughs> they don't get the trash picked up. And it, and it has been um, voted down at least twice before. And I'm, I'm up uh, speaking against this article. Thank you. On my left. Mary Larson Marlowe, 238 Hayden Rose Street. Um, I just have a clarification question. Is this a general bylaw or a zoning bylaw? So to answer you, this is uh, recommended as a zoning bylaw? Okay. So a zoning bylaw would not um, affect condominium or neighborhood um, uh, garden apartments that are already built. The zoning bylaw does not grandfather, so it does not affect anything in the past. Is that correct? Uh, I will. I believe you are correct, but just get legal's verification. That is correct. Okay. So this zoning bylaw proposal would affect only new condominium developments. In which case, new condominium developments that wish to have. Um, uh, trash pickup would then be built appropriately 
with the right you know sizing and and uh, uh, street uh, you know the weight limits for the street and the, that sort of thing so that would be appropriate for future but I would not support it being um, approved for past again for many of the reasons um, Ms. Lafreniere just mentioned thank you thank you excuse me Hold on one second. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody clearly understands how the retroactive application of zoning changes occurs. So currently there is a zoning provision that prohibits residential developments in these specialized districts from having public trash pickup. This amendment would remove that restriction. Whether it would apply to existing facilities will depend on what's in their special permits, which I have not reviewed and I don't know that anybody has reviewed. But if their special permit contains that kind of a restriction in it, which probably it does, um, they would have the opportunity to uh, go to the Special Permit Granting Authority, the Planning Board in this case, and uh, seek to have that condition removed. Uh, it's different if the situation where, the, where we're going to make the, um, the provision tighter, then we would say that the existing um, uses were totally exempt but since we're making the uh, the prohibition looser it would depend on whether the uh, permits that have been issued include that requirement also thank you on my right ted barker hook 75 grove street through the moderator i wonder if mr trendle can give us a brief summary of why the planning board uh, voted uh, against this article. Could I, uh, could I interrupt for a second? Certainly. The planning board voted when the language said the town will provide the services. The amended uh, article at this point simply says town may provide. Mr. Garabini is correct. I'm sure Mr. Trendle can accommodate that change. So I uh, through the moderator, I can, I can understand that change, but to Mr. Garbedian's point, what the planning board voted on was the original language that it will, uh, that it, that it will require uh, trash collection, not may. So um, the planning board, I don't think, has a formal position on the revised language, um, but I, I can tell you that uh, you know, many of the things that we discussed um, Mary Larson Marlowe has already brought up. We had uh, concerns, uh, we had financial implications of concerns as how this might potentially open up uh, uh, a pretty big financial impact to the town as it look at all garden style apartments and the potential for trash pickup. And there is uh, some concern with regards to how this might retroactively apply and, and if it even uh, were to meet the needs. But again, that was on the uh, original uh, article, uh, not the amended one. On my right. Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road, um, through the moderator, I don't know whose question this would be, but would the town, if we did accept this, would the town perhaps be put in a position where they would have to buy different types of trucks or things to be able to fit in to these condominiums and things, even with it saying may provide it? I'm going to turn that over to the DPW. Through the moderator, uh, we did ask this question of our trash collection company, E.O. Harvey, um, and what they said was that they would re be required to add 2.5 more root days to pick it all up. So what that means is where we currently have um, five days where there's one truck collecting trash, they'd have to add two and a half more. So that would mean additional trucks on the roads, 
I don't know if they would have to have special trucks, but it would be certainly additional trucks at additional cost to the town. Thank you. On my left. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Thomas Terry, 17 Maple Street. What extent are we talking about? Are we talking about every condominium in Hopkinton and inc might include the uh, legacy farms, uh, the one on, in, in back of uh, Gross, uh, Hayden Main Street there, uh, Walnut, uh, Walcott Valley, there's the one over on Wood Street, Patriot, there's one on Woods, the, another one over by 495 off of Lumber Street. Uh, there's two others in town I can't think of right now. But I can see an increase of somewhat into the, between one and two million dollars a year on our budget if this were passed. My first question comes back to this will or must, or whatever that word was. Uh, it's kind of an ambiguous question. How can you be asked a question like that? And also, if this puts all the power in the hands of the DPW and the selectmen and takes it away from the townspeople, that's not what we're here for. So I think this, we should first analyze, my one question will be, this article today is gonna to include I'm sure Mr. Markarian's, where he lives down Hayden Row, and what others, if any, or is anybody in town who wants to jump in going to get in this bathtub? So, so Mr. Terry, to your, to your first question, it, it would include all garden apartments in residential districts and village housing in residential districts. So I think nothing is, is excluded. What would be excluded? Nothing. None of so those. this would cover the whole town? Every, every condominium in Hopkins would automatically have to be picked up? Is that what you're saying? It, every condominium in Hopkinton would be included in this question that the town may, the service may be provided by the town. Right. When these condominium uh, developers came in to see you on the planning board, you were probably on the planning board. I'm sorry, excuse me. I, you, we're going to get the attorneys. When you, maybe, maybe I messed that up. So this is a this is a uh, provision that uh, applies only in the. Um, thank you. Uh, now it's big enough I can read it. The gar garden apartment um, uh, garden apartments in oh, residential. residential districts and village housing in residential districts. So. Um, the, so it doesn't apply townwide, although those are pretty broad categories. What was that again? I didn't hear that last part. Like the last part was it does not apply townwide, but those are pretty large um, uh, categories. Where does it apply specifically? Since you know it doesn't apply townwide, could we explain exactly which units are included that were approved when they when they brought their their plan to the town to the planning board? I started to say, one of the things that they promised at the town, in order to get this permit passed, they would get they would take care of their own plumbing, they would take care of their own lighting, they would take care of their own garbage, they would take care of this, and they wouldn't take care of this. And it was a plan that was made with the developer. Then all these people bought the condominiums with the full understanding that that took place. And now we're changing it around so that the rest of the town is all going to chip in and pay that bill. Is that the way, is, is that about what I'm, what I'm saying true? Well, all this, the, the effect of this zoning is to remove the prohibition. So right now, Rub, uh, town sponsored rubbish removal is prohibited for these kinds of developments. This provision would remove that prohibition. That's not the same thing as requiring it. The original motion would have required it or would have purported to require it. Um, and we had previously advised that we didn't think a zoning bylaw had, could, could, in fact, make such a requirement. This would simply remove the prohibition. Whether or not the town then would elect to um, um, 
provide the rubbish disposal services is completely a separate matter. Nothing here would require them to do it. Um, and as far as the first part of, uh, of your question, uh, how many of these there are, exactly where they're located, I think that's something that we would have to defer to the um, uh, planning staff to answer for you. And also, could we get the dump, uh, are the trucks, uh, or the, the town trucks, I don't know whether the town would do it or sell. We sometimes may try to do this ourselves. Can we get our trucks in there? But I stand against this um, amendment. We're working on an amendment now to accept the word will, aren't we? So well, this isn't the article. This is just the amendment we're discussing. So the motion was made with the amended language. So I believe it is the, the article we are discussing. Did we ever vote to accept the amendment? The motion was made to incorporate the amendment. So it's the article in question. So the petitioner changed his motion to, to reflect the word. Can you add an amendment without a vote of the townspeople? The petitioner can make the motion the way he or she chooses. Go ahead. So what's contained in the motions document are the motions that we anticipated for today. But until the first motion is made, you're not amending anything. So the first motion made was not the one in the motions document, but was instead the amended language, or what we're referring to as the amended language, but which is in fact the original motion language at this point. Well, the planning board uh, voted against it, and did the selectmen, the select board vote against it also? So I don't believe the select board did, but I'll ask. The select board voted um, against approval. Okay. Well, thank you very much. On my right. Here, there we go. A couple of questions. Uh, Steve Popkus, 24 C Street Extension. Uh, a couple of questions for counsel because I'm still a little confused on what may means in this context. I understand what he said before that the special waiver, if it contained uh, uh, a provision about not picking up the rubbish, then that would continue. However, does this mean in the future that if we don't want to do rubbish pickup with a new development, we would have to put it in the special waiver. Does the planning board have the ability to do that? Are there any provisions to allow the planning board or is it, does that come into the four corners of their ability? All those kinds of questions. Mr. Trendle. So my understanding is that our existing bylaws prohibit town collection uh, in garden style apartments of this type. Um, so we would not be able to uh, incorporate rubbish collection uh, for future uh, applications or developments uh, in the future. I'm sorry, that was not my question, sir. I'm asking with the, if the amendment, if the amendment, if the war, if the article passed, I'm asking for the implications of removing that prohibition and replacing it with the ability of the town to make that decision and what the uh, limitations of that decision-making ability are. We'll go to the town attorney. I'll give it a try. For, we, for every special permit that is issued, there are standards in the in the zoning bylaw that basically say that they are uh, the the uh, special permit granting authority can impose whatever conditions it deems necessary to protect the public interest. So, um, if the special permit granting authority determines that um, trash. Uh, Public fun, publicly funded trash pickup is necessary in order for the special permit to be issued, it could still require that. That's not the same thing as saying that therefore rubbish pickup would be required because the special permit, 
there's no special permit you can issue that can require the town to provide a service that it does not choose to provide. So it would still be up to the DPW and um, uh, to the select board ultimately um, to determine whether they wanted to enter into a contract to provide this service. And um, obviously there's an expense involved and there's other considerations that, that they would be free to make and no zoning decision can compel it. Thank you. Thank you. On my left. Yes, ma'am. Mike Shepard, 11 Hill Street. Um, I rise in opposition to this article. Um, most of the projects that we're talking about, uh, the village apartments, the condominium projects, uh, all have the same thing in common, and it's the density. And when they were initially approved, uh, this was part of the deal. The, the part of the deal was you take care of your own trash. Everybody that bought a condominium unit, everybody that's looking to buy condominium units knows this is what the rules are. And what this would do is change the rules in midstream. Um, I can't accept the fact that I'm going to pay as a public citizen for so, you know somebody's uh, trash pickup that they already agreed they'd take care of. It's part of their deed. Uh, I just stand in opposition to this article. Thank you. Thank you. On my right. Brian Herr, Hayden Rose Street. I move the question, please. Again, that motion is always in order by vo voice vote. We will consider whether to end debate. All those in favor of ending debate signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, so we're ready for a vote. Um, we're going to stand and count for this one. All those in favor of Article 37 as moved, uh, please stand with your yellow voting pass. We have one on the stage. Center right five. I'm sorry. Center right five. Center right five. Center and left, six. Center and left, six. All those opposed, please rise with your yellow voting passes. There are 22 on the stage. <laughs> Center right, 28. Center right, 28. Center and left, 
44. Center and left, 44. The article fails. Hold on, I'm doing the math. It fails, yes votes 12, no votes 94. Okay. All right, article 38. The select board. We move that the town vote to amend the general bylaw of the town of Hopkins and is set forth in Article 38 of the 2021 annual town meeting warrant. Are there any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. It clearly passes, it's a simple majority. And Tom is back. <laughs> Article 39, stormwater management and erosion control. And the general bylaws of the town of Hopkins is set forth in Article 39 of the 2021 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. And some background on this. Uh, this bylaw is a revision of the town's existing stormwater bylaw, <clears throat> and it is required by the EPA's and DEP's general permit for stormwater discharges from small municipal separate storm sewer systems MS4 permit. This bylaw revision not only keeps us in compliance with the MS4 permit, but it also helps to further protect and enhance public health, safety, and the environment. If approved, the bylaw revision will help keep our wetlands, streams, and water bodies protected in, uh, I'm sorry, from storm water runoff from developments. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of this motion in this article signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it passes. Article 40, obstruction of streets and sidewalks and housekeeping. We move that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of Hopkins and as set forth in Article 40 of the 2021 annual town meeting warrant. And again, any background on this, Mr. Tedstone? This article would amend three related bylaws. The article proposes to revise the town's existing streets and sidewalk bylaw to further protect the, streets to, the town's streets and sidewalks from debris being placed on them. The revision prohibits anybody from putting material, whether natural or artificial, including but not limited to snow, leaves, sand, and other debris on a town street or sidewalk. The process began with, a, with valid citizen complaints about people depositing leaves and other debris onto sidewalks and streets that impedes vehicles and pedestrians and created a public safety issue. The town currently has a bylaw that addresses the deposit of snow but nothing else. Therefore, staff drafted an amendment to the depositing snow bylaw by, uh, to include leaves and debris for the board and town council to review. And during this process, it was noticed that there are three bylaws that use different, uh, similar, sorry, different terms for similar things and that the language is used by the three uh, should be coordinated. Uh, therefore, depositing snow, the, the depositing snow bylaw would be renamed obstruction of streets and sidewalks and it would be expanded to cover leaves, sand and other debris that's deposited by a person onto streets, sidewalks and parking areas that are open to public use in ways that unreasonably impair the use or function of the area. The bylaw doesn't apply to anybody authorized by the town, such as the town itself or a contractor doing work for the town. The $25 penalty in the bylaw is unchanged and each day would constitute a separate violation. The intent of this bylaw is to keep street sidewalks and ways open and unobstructed for public use. Housekeeping language changes to the driveways and temporary road closures bylaws uh, would be made for clarity and consistency among the three bylaws. There's no change to the intent and meaning of those bylaws. Is there any discussion? Yes. 
On my right. Dale Danahy, 25 East Main Street. Could we also include the words water? Because I walk around uptown a lot and people take their sump pumps and dump them right on the sidewalk, which is sometimes ankle deep in the summer, sometimes it's ice in the winter, and it creates a hazard that needs to be addressed in this bylaw. Are you, Dale, are you proposing an amendment? Just, yes, to add the word water uh, in the list of, you know, with leaves, snow, sand, or other debris. Could we say water and leaves, snow? Or is it unnecessary? Is it considered other natural material? Brian. Yeah, yeah, the way we drafted this was to be all inclusive. So it would be, under the language of the current text, it would be included as a natural material. Perfect. On my left. Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. I don't have any problem with the article, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I do applaud the DPW. They keep my streets nice and clean in the wintertime with all the snow. However, I do know when they go down the street, that oftentimes the plows um, dig up the grass along my sidewalk and they deposit snow on my driveway and they deposit snow on my sidewalk. I don't know how we determine if I put the snow there or if they have. I will tell you I don't do that. But um, so my question is enforcement and um, also too, it, how would you ever determine if the snow just naturally fell there or if people along my street are you know, cleaning off their driveways and depositing it on the sidewalk. Moderator. Go ahead, Mr. Westerling. Through the moderator, thank you very much for the compliment. We truly appreciate that. <laughs> uh, if you ever find that we have torn up uh, because the ground isn't frozen yet, please call the Department of Public Works. We always go back in the springtime. We will make any repairs to any uh, any, anything that we've disturbed. Uh, the, the intent for, for snow, it's very easy for us to determine whether or not, for example, someone who's plowing a private driveway leaves a mound of snow at the end of the driveway across the street. That's very easy for us to determine and to enforce. Uh, then I, if, through the moderator, if I may, a quick follow-up question. Uh, when the trucks go down and they pile the snow up in front of my driveway and then I clear it, I don't put it out on the street, I put it back, try to put it back toward my lawn, but um, if someone's going down trying to enforce this, how would they know if the town town plow, excuse me, the town plow put the snow back there at the end of my driveway and by the street, or if I did it? Through the moderator, uh, that's easy for us to determine based on the storm and the equipment that we have out there. And I will state just for clarification that we already have a bylaw that restricts or, or prevents snow, snow from being placed in the street. So that's something that's already there. Uh, the amendments and the revisions are geared more towards people putting things like leaves in the street or sand or other uh, natural, natural items. The snow already exists. Thank you. You're welcome. On my right. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. Is this applicable only to the done deed or to the actual doing of the deed? I raise this because of people wielding leaf blowers, uh, blowing stuff across the street, both when I've been by on my bicycle, which is most unpleasant, or driving by in the car, which is equally unkind. Do you want me to answer that? Does that beg an answer? Yeah, don't, don't uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, what this states is that unreasonably impairs the use or function of the way, uh, whether it's the roadway or the sidewalk. So uh, if they are caught in the act and they actually have deposited materials in either the roadway or the sidewalk, then they are in violation of this bylaw. Okay, seeing no more questions, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. <clears throat> Article 41, street opening permits. Mr. Tedstone. 
We move that the town vote to amend the general bylaw of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 42 of the 2021 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. And again, some background. Uh, I am going to pass this off to uh, Amy Ritterbush. Thank you. Uh, this new article codifies the current practice of the DPW for issuing street opening permits on public ways and includes an enforcement mechanism. The work that needs a permit is that which requires the opening of the road surface or work within the right of way of the public way. Codifying these practices into a bylaw increases transparency and visibility for this administrative process and adding an enforcement mechanism allows the town to follow up if someone does not adhere to the permit conditions. Are there any questions about this article? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Article 42, Trench Safety Officer. Mr. Tedstone. We move that the town vote to amend the general bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 42 of the 2021 Annual Town Meeting Warrant. And then an explanation. Back to Amy. Thank you. This bylaw designates the town manager as the permitting authority for issuing trench permits pursuant to the relevant state laws, which uh, relate to excavation and trench safety. The town may charge a fee for permits and develop rules and regulations consistent with the law. The town manager may delegate these duties to another town officer, such as the DPW director. Town Council has recommended that the town adopt this bylaw so as to be compliant with the state law passed by the legislature a few years ago. Are there any questions? Seeing none, let's take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Article 43, <clears throat> Land Acquisitions and Dispositions, 148 Lumber Street. Is there a historical uh, commission representative? Yes, Eric Sonnet, 60 Teresa Road, member of the historical commission. This article uh, deals with the McFarland Sanger House. This is a house that came uh, to Hopkinton with the development of the Deerfield Estates uh, project. The house is the oldest house in Hopkinton. Unfortunately, when it was conveyed to the town, no provisions were made for water and sewer. And the lot is very, very small, and it appears unable to handle both a septic field and a well within the confines of the lot. Therefore, it has been a very uh, frustrating process to find a use for the facility. Basically, uh, the Historical Commission's been operating on a CPC grant to uh, restore the property. At this point, the only monies that really have been expended have been expended to stop further deterioration of a very old property that is not inhabited. It is our desire, if you will, to find a way to convey the property to a new owner who will use it and restore it, or at least be part of a restoration project, and enter into a deed restriction that it cannot be uh, abused, if you will. We want to keep the historical concept. Basically, to do that, re requires a permission to sell the property. The Historical Commission does not have the authority to do that. We're an appointed board. Therefore, this article uh, stands to convey the property to the select board to make those determinations uh, on its future use. Historical will still be the uh, operating uh, town committee that will seek a resolution and there probably is a resolution but who's ever negotiating it 
needs to feel comfortable that if they're trying to sell it, it can actually be sold. Mm -hmm. So I'll make a motion for the historical uh, commission to uh, the wording of Article 43 as contained in the warrants and motions pamphlet. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tentstone. The select board recommends approval. Mr. Manning. The Appropriation Committee recommends approval. And Capital Improvements. Capital Improvement Committee recommends approval. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. And we don't need a vote. <laughs> Standing vote. Article 44. <clears throat> Teresa Road to Hughes Farm Trail. This is a citizen's petition. Is the petitioner here? Who is it? Peter Lagoy, 21 Hayden Rose Street. Um, as a citizen, we vote to take uh, we vote to take no action on this article. <laughs> Mr. Tenstone. The select board recommends no action. Mr. Manning. Appropriation. Appropriation committee recommends no action. And capital improvements. Capital improvement committee recommends no action. I should make it. <laughs> Is there any discussion on the uh, recommendations that we take on this article, rec which have been recommended to be no action? On By right. way of further explanation, this Please. was. Um, a motion that was, or an article that was brought to us to acquire a portion of three pieces of property to allow a trail to be put in between Teresa Road collecting, or connecting to the new um, Hughes Farm Trail. We, another citizen had verbal agreement from three property owners. Um, when the Trail Co Coordination and Management Committee looked at this, um, further and before we spent money on it, we asked for written agreement on the from these three property owners, and we were unable to obtain written agreement to allow the town to acquire these three parcels at that time. So we chose not to go forward with the with the article. Okay. Any questions regarding this article? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by to. It, all those in favor of taking no action signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And so no action will be taken. So we're almost at the end of town meeting. Uh, before I turn to uh, Mr. Ted Stone for the final motion, I want to extend my thanks to everyone involved from all of the uh, town staff, from all of the volunteer committees, uh, for my deputy moderator, uh, for HCAM and for uh, everyone who has played a role in, uh, in both enabling this meeting to uh, take place with virtually no hitches um, and, and to you as the residents and voters in town for your participation as well. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn to Mr. Ted Stone for final motion. Thank you, Tom. So normally I would push this off to my vice chair, uh, but I will do this myself. Uh, we move that the 2021 annual town meeting be adjourned until the postponed date of the annual town election, May 22, 2021, to be held at the Hopkins Middle School Gymnasium and to further, I'm sorry, and further that the annual town meeting shall be dissolved upon the close of the polls on that date. Thank All you. those Thank in you. favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.